Yes, the weekend is finally here. It is Saturday, September 16th. You're watching Ireland AM. Good morning. Yeah, and the, is the rain going away, though? No, it's not going mm. anywhere. No. Uh, coming up this morning, we look forward to Ireland's potential Tonga-shaped World Cup banana skin and the rest of the day's sport as well. Irish actor Gronya Keenan tells us about life on the set of Blood with Adrian Dunbar and starring in an all-female cast at The Gate. He's a highly respected actor, comedian and now playwright. We'll be catching up with Martin Bean's ward for a chat. And Martin will finally be getting his old football friend when former in between her. <laughs> what are you trying to say? Nothing, I'm saying nothing. I didn't say the bus thing at least. Um, actor James Buckley joins us a little later on. Well, I'm glad you didn't say the bus thing. <laughs> uh, what's coming up in fashion this morning, Katya? Well, good morning, guys. I'm with Laura Jordan, and we're going to get ready to elevate your style game as we dive into the world of blazers. Tell us a little bit more, Laura. There is nothing a blazer can A cut shoulder cannot fix, mm. Katya. So we're going to look at how to elevate simple basics, dresses, tees, and trousers with a variety of blazers shapes and styles and how to wear them lots of different ways. Exciting stuff. I mean, we forgot our blazers, but at least we remembered our leather pants We did today. indeed. We all got leather that Leather pants gang. <laughs> okay, that is coming up later. But for now, let's see what the world is looking like as you wake up. Hannah Murphy is in the Virgin Media News Hub. Thanks, Katia, and good morning. There's a growing fear about disease spread in Libya in the aftermath of fatal flooding that has destroyed whole neighbourhoods and made it difficult to get aid to the region. The Red Cross says the death toll has exceeded 11,000 people. Civilians are now being prevented from entering the flood-stricken eastern city of Derna. Only search teams looking through the mud and wrecked buildings for up to 10,000 people still missing are being allowed in. The emergency teams on the ground in the city include personnel from Italy and Turkey. Local officials say more search equipment and personnel are urgently needed. Two dams collapsed in exceptionally heavy rains during Storm Daniel earlier this week, sending a wall of water several metres high down a valley that cuts through the city. The relief efforts have been slowed by the destruction of several bridges leading into Derna. The potential spread of cholera could be fatal for many more. The floods also moved and destabilised explosives left over after the recent civil conflict, something it's feared could put more lives at risk. Marie Mulcahy, Virgin Media News. A monument will be unveiled at Garda headquarters today to remember all Gardaí who have died while in service. President Michael D. Higgins will lay a wreath during the service, which will also be attended by the Garda Commissioner, the Minister for Justice, and by the family, friends and colleagues of those who've died. The monument will include the names of over 1,800 Gardaí who have died in service over the last 100 years. A woman in her 30s is in a critical condition following a crash between a lorry and a car in County Cork yesterday. The collision took place on the Bandon to Dunmanway Road at around 10 o'clock yesterday morning. The woman is being treated for her injuries at Cork University Hospital. Gardaí have carried out a technical examination of the scene and the road has since reopened. There's an appeal for any witnesses to come forward to Gardaí. Now, prosecutors in Donald Trump's election interference trial have asked a judge to issue a gag order on the former president to limit how he can comment publicly on the case. Special counsel Jack Smith and his team have accused Mr. Trump of intimidating witnesses and potential jurors. And they say the gag order is needed to protect the integrity of the trial. The judge has yet to make a decision. Mr. Trump, who's currently campaigning for another term in the White House, has lashed out at the request. And they want to see if they can silence me. So the media, the fake news, will ask me a question. I'm sorry, I won't be able to answer that. How do you think we do in that election? So we're going to have a little bit of a fun with that, I think, because that's a tough one. Can you imagine? Sticking with the US, where millions of people are under storm warnings as they brace for the arrival of Hurricane Lee. It's been making its way towards New England and eastern Canada, with officials in both Maine and Massachusetts already declaring a state of emergency. Around four inches of rain is expected to fall, bringing flooding and strong winds, which could also knock out power lines. The storm moved through Bermuda on Thursday, leaving many there without power. The North Korean leader has been given a rare look inside a Russian fighter jet factory, a tour that came complete with a close-up look inside the cockpit. It's the same plant that Kim Jong-un's father visited on a similar trip 20 years ago. Experts believe the visit may prove useful to North Korea as much of its air fleet is outdated. 
During his visit to Russia, Kim Jong-un has given his backing to Vladimir Putin and his war in Ukraine. And finally, a painting from the very first episode of Bob Ross, The Joy of Painting, has been listed for sale for almost $10 million. A Minnesota-based gallery is selling the oil painting titled A Walk in the Woods. It was painted live on air in 1983. The beloved show went on to produce more than 400 episodes, securing Bob Ross's status as a cultural icon. Brilliant. Now let's get a first check of the weather you're waking up to this morning. You need to be chill to handle Irish weather. That's why Chill sponsor weather updates in Virgin Media One. This afternoon will be overcast with occasional light rain and mist for many towards the east of the country. Connacht will see brighter and drier conditions. Temperatures will range from 14 to 16 degrees. This evening will remain wet and overcast with mainly er many areas seeing patches of drizzle and mist. Temperatures will range from 14 to 16 degrees, while tonight will remain cloudy with occasional outbreaks of rain moving from the southeast further north over the course of the night. Temperatures will range from 10 to 16 degrees. You need to be chilled to handle Irish weather. That's why Chill sponsor weather updates in Virgin Media One. All right, let's take a first check in your morning papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. It leads with TikTok fined 345 million euro over child privacy. They write the Chinese-owned app incentivized children to skip privacy settings, the Irish regulator finds. The examiner also leads with TikTok false, a danger to Irish children. The story continues. TikTok's failure to safely handle the data of children represents a clear danger to a large number of Irish children, campaigners have claimed. Uh, the front page of the Irish Independent leads with the headline New Mortgage Relief Plan to Ease Pressure of Spiralling Interest Rates. They report struggling mortgage holders are in line for short-term financial support to meet their interest repayments as the government comes under mounting pressure to respond to the latest ECB rate rise in next month's budget. Moving on to the tabloids now, the Daily Mail leads with contagion of court dodgers over TV licence. The paper writes that the judge, who previously criticised freeloaders in RTE, ordered Gardaí to arrest defaulters who failed to turn up to hearings. The Mirror goes with Paddy Crack, uh, writing Patrick Kilty brought the fun back to RTE last night as he opened his first Late Late Show with a joke-filled monologue about the payments crisis. The Star also leads with this story going with the headline Host with the Roast. The paper writes Patrick Keelty repeatedly poked fun at the RTE secret payment scandal and former host Ryan Tuberty during his opening monologue last night. Uh, then we have The Sun with the headline More the Merrier. The story continues. Uh, Christy Moore is sitting on more than two million amid a mighty cash surge. And the Herald leads with I leave home to refugees. It writes that a Dublin old age pensioner who took in a Ukrainian family wants them to stay on in his home after he is gone. Now, if you've kids, you may have just about started to turn your attention to Halloween and fair play to you for that. But apparently you're already way behind the curve. Mm. Yes, and do not judge me for this. Do not give out. Apparently it's now only 100 days to Christmas. Yes! <laughs> yes! Some retailers want you to know about it. I knew you'd do that. You're like you Martin Marilyn loves elf. Christmas. You love Christmas. I am elf. <laughs> Did you not know? <laughs> I do now. You do now. Yeah, it's 100 days September. Saying, you've been counting down since last Easter for Christmas. I count down from Stevens. But now should we not wait until Halloween is over? Like at least the first of November, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm not saying put up your Christmas tree. Yeah. I'm just saying it's September 16th. It's 100 days to Christmas. Now I know Arnott's have opened up their. Christmas store. We talked about this on the show as well two weeks ago. Brian Thomas had their yeah. Christmas store open since August. You know, our producer was talking about their child wanting a selection box from Dunn Stores. So I feel like a lot of the retailers now are already oh, gearing it, up for, it, it, for it's Christmas. It's starting earlier and earlier yeah. every year. Yeah. And do you know what I found out the other day? Go on. The controversial coffee cream in the Quality Street box. They're bringing it back, but not in the box, only in the kind of advent calendar -y things, the Christmas the Christmas specials of Quality yeah. Street will have it. Nowhere else, they're springing it back. Who oh, eats okay. the coffee cream? Who eats the coffee cream? Anyone? Well, anyone? Anyone no. in here? No. no. Not no. one no. person in no. the entire studio eats coffee cream. Well, I just know. Oh, actually, tell. We have one. We have one. We have, we have one. one. We have well, one. I just know for Christmas, like from my experience, because I worked in retail for six years, that I'm very 
anti-Christmas until the last week of November. Because last week. Oh, the abuse, the abuse we get from customers working in the sales. Abuse. Well, she's on. You have no idea. But um, no, I don't know. Hopefully this year will be different because I'm not working in retail. But I, I, I'd say after I Halloween at least. Do you hate Christmas music? Because I remember last year I went in, I think it was Christmas Eve or the day before Christmas Eve, to Brown Thomas to buy just a last minute present for someone very posh. I know I had loads of money then, joking. But um, <laughs> I, was, I was actually buying a pair of spanks because I couldn't fit into my Christmas Day outfit. Anyway, well, you know. I, I went in and um, there was a busker singing the fairy tale yeah. of New York. Yeah. For the millionth time, the millionth time. And she was like, yeah. I think I'm losing the will to live. Yeah. And yeah. just like she was just about to crack. You hear it and you're like, no, so not I, again. I, no, I, <laughs> I, I walked through Brown Thomas just just to see what the Christmas shop was like. Um, and there was Christmas music on. And I thought, this is August. They'll be so cheesed off with see, Christmas music I, by the end of September. I get so excited about Christmas every year. And every year it's very disappointing. So I'm not getting excited I this year. I think let the anticipation build up in the right bit. Will you lot at home let yeah. us know? Is it too early to be talking about Christmas or are you all in? Are it's you ready for it? It's days to go. Yeah. Countdown is yeah. really on. Now the kids are going to start writing lists. Well, you see. And we're going to be blamed for it. No. Of course we are. Right, up next, we look forward to Ireland's big World Cup clash with Tonga and ask what's going on with even more soap opera carry on at Old Trafford. We'll see you for that for sport in just a minute. All this week on Ireland AM, we're getting cosy with Harry. Do you have a conservatory that needs some TLC? Well, here's your chance to win a fantastic prize. How does a new cosy roof and a Harry Corey home interiors makeover sound to you? We're giving you the chance to convert your conservatory into a perfect living space with a roof conversion. And there'll also be a 6,000 euro Harry Corey voucher included to help you decorate the space and make it your own. Harry Corey has an extensive range of curtains and curtain poles bedding, lamps, towels and much more for you to choose from that will be a perfect fit in your more energy efficient revamped conservatory. To be in with a chance of winning this great prize just submit pictures of your conservatory and why it deserves some much needed TLC to Ireland AM Comp at virginmedia.ie Welcome back. Was Andy Farrell right to go full strength for Ireland's World Cup clash with Tonga tonight? We're here to answer that and all of today's big questions in the sports world is Virgin Media Sports' Joe Caulfield. Uh, but first, here's a pick of the sports headlines, starting with the Irish Daily Mirror. Uh, they go with Jaden Sancho, as in done. Eric Ten Hag has told Jaden Sancho there is no guarantee that he'll play for Manchester United again. Uh, the Herald also go with the Jaden Sancho story. They go with Ten Hag. I had to punish them. And finally, it's a clean sweep of Manchester United's headlines, this time about both Sancho and Anthony, the Irish independent lead with Ten Hag, saying he wouldn't be doing his job if he didn't ban them. Uh, Joe, good to see you. We're good to be here. We will talk Premier League in a few minutes' time, but, uh, but first, of course, the big game of the day, yeah. Ireland against Tonga tonight. And the surprise, where well, we heard that it's a full, well, as close to a full-strength Irish team as we can get with Johnny Sexton in as well, because we did expect that he might take a rest today. Mm -hmm. Look, the more I've been thinking about this, the more sense it makes to me. So, against Romania, obviously Johnny was really, really good. His ability to pick the right passes, to make the right decision, to unlock defences was all there. And Ireland, although they were a little bit sloppy in the first half, they, got, they were very cohesive by the end and it was an extremely comprehensive win in the end. But when I watched it back, Romania completely sat off Ireland. They didn't pressurise the Ireland attack. They had all the time in the world that they needed to pick those passes. If you're looking ahead to South Africa next week, you will have no time. Mm. They will put so much pressure on the Irish attack, they'll have no time to think. So if you're thinking about the first team that are gonna line out next week, they need another level of preparation for that. And that's Tonga. Tonga will pressurise the Irish attack they will give them less time to make those decisions. And if they come through that largely unscathed, then they'll be ready to face South Africa. And if we're going to win the World Cup, Ireland aren't going to just get past the quarterfinals. They're going there to win it. Mm -hmm. If you want to prove your credentials, they have to go out and beat South Africa next week. To do that, they need to be primed. And I think he's right to put out his first team to prepare them for that challenge. OK, um, we were just saying yesterday uh, that that 
the, the game against Samoa might might have come into his thinking as well. That I think so. Ireland struggled in that game. And you look at the France game against Uruguay. So France put out oh, yeah. a mixed strength team, a, a second strength team. They got over the line in the same way that Ireland got over the line against Samoa. But if Ireland had the same performance against Tonga this week, it creeps into next week. All the questions that the players are doing in their pressers is, well, are you really properly prepared? You really haven't hit the heights of, of the Six Nations and are, are you still that team? And is this World Cup voodoo coming back? They need to go out and put in a really comprehensive performance so it doesn't suck the momentum out of next mm -hmm. week. And I think they need their first team to do that because Tonga are going to pose a, a, a serious challenge. They have four former All Blacks. Like you take their centre partnership is Malachi Fekitawa, who's just won the URC with Munster, and Pita Aki, who's just won the top 14 with Toulouse. They're a very serious centre partnership. Now, they don't have that 1 to 15, but they have enough really quality international players, world class players to really test Ireland if Ireland aren't on their game. And they haven't played a game in the World Cup so far. All of their focus for the last three months has been Ireland, day yeah, one. Yeah. Bring the passion, bring the intensity. Ireland have to be ready for that. It's, it's going to be a fascinating game, all right. But of course, you, you talk about performance. The priority is to win. Yeah, and once you think you got that in the bag, then then and then, and then, then the bring them off after 50 or 60 minutes. Yeah. But give them that comprehensive challenge and then wrap them up and uh, bring on the players who might need more game time off the bench. Uh, we weren't surprised um, with New Zealand's win last night. We were expecting a 60 or 70 point uh, win for them against Namibia. They needed it uh, because of the defeat last week to France. But 25 minutes in and they've already got their bonus point. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think, uh, as you say, the performance against France was, was quite slap, sloppy. It was quite lacklustre, actually, I thought. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the two tries they scored were impressive, but I thought in general they were just off the pace. They come out against Namibia and you felt sorry for Namibia because mm -hmm. there was going to be an All Blacks backlash. Yeah. And they were just in the, uh, in the line of fire. Um, I thought there was, there was certain uh, combinations that worked quite well. Uh, I thought their scrum half, their, their halfback pairing of Mackenzie and Legroy were, were, were very effective. Uh, but I think the most significant thing that came out of this game is that their, um, their front row, Ethan Legroy, got sent off for yes. another high challenge. He's probably going to receive a, um, a two-match ban off of that. They're playing Italy next week. And, like, they were 60 points up at that stage. Was it was no so unnecessary. Yeah. And now he's put his team under a lot of pressure. Obviously, he wouldn't be starting next week, but he's a good player. He had scored a try. He had done everything right to put himself in the, pre in the frame to be in the match day 23. Mm -hmm. And now he's going to be out of contention. OK, uh, there's a lot of rugby you can watch across the weekend here on Virgin Media. Uh, we'll move on to last night's football because Derry City were so close to closing that gap on Shamrock Rovers, reducing it to a point. Late penalty gives Rovers the draw and they leave uh, the Brandywell. Still four points clear at the top. Yeah, I, I felt Derry had the winner of that game. Um, tight enough. Great the, header. Yeah, to put like. Them in the lead. So, brave header. And building up to that in the start of the second ha half, they had really upped the intensity from the first half. They were putting on all the pressure. They deserved that goal. Two minutes later, O'Reilly, sorry, O'Reilly goes through and he had a chance to, to, to put them 2 0 up and have them home and hosed. And he missed his chance to pull it wide. And this is 10 minutes from time. Yeah. I didn't like there was contact, but like if the penalty wasn't give, given, you could understand why as well. It was a bit of a soft one. Yeah. And Rovers get out of there with their four point uh, advantage intact. And, and I think they'll consider themselves lucky to do so because there's six games left. That was the most challenging yeah. matchup they had. That was Derry's real chat. Like, I don't see Der uh, Rovers dropping four uh, points in the next six games. Yeah, yeah. You know? Will they draw twice? Will they lose once and draw once? And then will, will Derry be flawless in yeah, that same yeah, period yeah, of time? Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't last night like was their chance. You have to yeah. feel. And uh, good wins last night in the cup for Pats for Bows. Uh, Galway United. Man. 4-0 against Dundalk Unbelievable. and yeah. Cork City into the semi-finals as well. So yeah, yeah. so um, you'd have to say that. Bows and Pats are probably the two happiest coming out of that because um, like, like for, like, I just thought for Dundalk to get knocked out was, was yeah, it, in such fashion as well. Yeah, but look, yeah. it's great to see and this is the cup. This is what you want to see. You want to see um, 
not unusual pairings, but you want to see teams from the lower leagues challenging and coming up in semi-final matchups against the, the Premier Division teams. OK, well, let's talk about Premier League cross-channel because there's a couple of tasty games yeah, coming up it's today. A weekend. Uh, our eyes will be on um, Manchester United and Brighton because... It's on or off the pitch? Yeah, I, I know, because yeah. there's as much drama going, all, going on off it as there is on it. Of course, we'll also want to see... How injured was Ferguson? Know, and will he be yeah. back in uh, know, to play yeah. up front or will Welbeck get a chance to play against his old team today? But it's the whole Jaden Sancho thing yeah. that has everybody's attention. It, it, I just feel this is, this is unnecessary. Like, now Tin Hag has to come out strong. I, I just felt after the Arsenal match when he was asked why wasn't Sancho selected, he could have just, like, passed that off as nothing. Yeah. Like, he didn't need to put the spotlight on Sancho. Mm -hmm. I don't see what the benefit of that was. Sancho couldn't have reacted any worse by coming out and calling him out on social media, but maybe he just feels frustrated because this isn't the first time that Sancho has been put on an individual training program. Yeah. There must be something going on in the background there, but now Ten Hag has doubled down and you can see why, because he wants to instill discipline in the team. He wants to see that if I'm challenged, that isn't going to work out. Nobody's bigger than the team, but United just don't need this right now. United need to be yeah. United and you know, it's not like they're having the stellar run of form. They have two wins out of four. They, they don't need this off-field controversy going on. Maybe it'll galvanise them. You know, uh, Martinez is back this weekend. I, I thought against Arsenal, if Garnacho's goal, which was really, really, really borderline offside, is allowed, I think they get out of there with a draw and the whole complexion yeah, of yeah, the yeah, international yeah. break is different and they come in this, like, the pressure's coming from all sides now in this United team. Brighton are coming in, bounding into this game in unbelievable form. Whether or not Ferguson starts is, is anyone's guess. The, the Brighton announcement yesterday, the press release yesterday, was that he's fit. You know, he's, mm -hmm. he's fit to play. Uh, I'd like to see. I'd like to see him play. I'd like to see him continue his form. I, I don't know why he didn't play for Ireland. You have to just take it at face value that he had a knock and they were protecting him. They brought him back to Brighton, but. Um, It'll be interesting. United need the win more than Brighton do, but Brighton have less pressure and are in better form. Yeah, yeah. And but United go into the game also without Anthony, who's obviously taken us a bicycle because of yeah. allegations made against him. And uh, Mason Mount is out of that midfield as well through injury. So yeah. it, it's going to be a fascinating game, all right. Uh, at the same time, West Ham United are entertaining Manchester City, and West Ham have had a tremendous start to the news. 100%. Season. So they've put. Three goals on both Chelsea and Brighton, two wins from that. Yeah. They're three wins and a draw so far. They're sitting in fourth, I think, in the table. And, OK, look, at like City like are just this unstoppable force. It seems like you're fighting against the tide. But they're going to go down to West Ham. West Ham are going to make, make it really difficult for them. Fulham made it difficult for them in the first half until yeah, that, yeah. That, that contentious Aki goal went in towards the end. And then, obviously, it was, it was yeah, yeah. the, the Haaland show second half. But, no, I, I think that... Uh, West Ham certainly have the capacity to, to put it up to them. It could be a two-all draw today. Who knows? And then okay. we might have a title chase. Okay. Uh, the first game of the day is Wolves and Liverpool. Klopp's not happy that his side have been asked to play at half twelve on a Saturday. When's Klopp every? I know. <laughs> to be no, fair, he's never happy. No, to be fair, <laughs> this, to be fair, this, like he is. The, it's this really like it's an anomaly in that I think from 18, 12, 30 starts, they have three points. Like it, I don't know what that's about, but like what, how we, how, what he would argue is that he's just got his international players, his uh, South American players, back from international break yesterday morning, and now they're on the road to Wolverhampton, and that's not easy. And they've had three times as many of these early kickoffs than City, for instance. And and he says people are just going to say I'm moaning about this, but when you look at the stats, it, it is unbalanced in our favour in terms of it being unfair. So, I don't, look, to be honest, I thought they were really good against Aston Villa last week. I think maybe he's just trying to take a little bit of pressure off his team Aston going down to Wolves, yeah, yeah. who are sitting 16th in the table. I think it'll be a fairly straightforward win for them regardless. OK. Joe, good to see you. Good to be here. All right. All right. There's plenty of World Cup action today here on Virgin Media 1. A coverage of Samoa against Chile gets underway at 1.30, followed by Wales versus Portugal. Stay with us. We're blazing a trail in fashion after this break. Very welcome back. Whether you're heading to the office or on a night out, Blazers are your style saviors. With Lord Jordan as our captain, we'll explore how Blazers can effortlessly transform 
Annie Alfred. Good morning, Laura. Good morning. Now, we're talking about blazers today, not leather yes. trousers. I know. We all seem to <laughs> we all decided to match each other today. To anyway, inspired. absolutely. Like yes. Blazers. Yes, so we're going to look at the power of a blazer. I really do believe they can elevate or transform a simple top dress, trouser, etc. So we're going to look at how they can do that and the variants that there are in terms of fabric style and shapes. You want to make sure you get the blazer that's right for you, for right. occasion, for the life you have, body shape, colour, etc. So okay, where we start? We are starting with more of a typical cut in terms of the shape of this, but with a brighter colour. So you want to have at least one item that has the punch in it and this is the item so there's a little metallic fleck through it we've got that taupe that lovely bright green and cream also what i like about this is the buttons move in a curve they're not straight up and down which tends to be a lot less flattering and nobody is, is built me meant to be worn open or closed you can do it either way we've yeah. left it open because we want to show the trousers underneath yeah. but it works really well closed very sharp finish to it and a lovely um, and just a lovely shape we are not you know 2d people i don't ever understand why things are not made for curve and shape and this is a good example of that and you can even see the way it moves in slightly at the back to nip in at the waist it just gives that finish and fit um, that we want. So this is the very much the Chanel style classic shape with a cut. So if you don't want the boxy finish, this is the one for you where it nips in nicely at the waist. In terms of other details that we've put with it, obviously there's gold in the buttons that we see on the sleeve and through the front of the jacket. So we want to complement that with gold jewellery. We've gone for the knot style, which is a big trend for uh, autumn winter. These are from Betty and Biddy, part of this large selection on their website. And then again, almost nautical, as we were saying earlier, um, with that rope finished chain with the texture and the smooth uh, links through it. Again, a nice detail just to pull together the metallics that we see in the rest of the piece. So again, a very good sort of cohesion you want. You don't want to put silver jewellery when you've got gold buttons and detail through it. Similarly with the bag, we've got a lovely uh, strap on this as well. And this is from Lally and Moo, which is available in uh, their website. It's a huge selection there. That also be worn as a clutch. Absolutely. Stick the chain in and hold it. Which yeah. we're seeing that kind of what we call the squishy clutch yeah. to give it its its formal and professional term. <laughs> um, squishy clutch. Yeah. Like. Does that soft leather. It's very luxe and again available uh, in their store in Wicklow as well. So there's a good option in terms of pulling together the colours with this. And we've taken the beige out of the jacket and brought it through on the trouser. Wide leg, big trend and again new. Like we see a wide leg trousers always in summer. To move them through to autumn winter is a new element for this season so lovely high waist lovely wide leg and we always want them to finish what I always say is go for two fingers above the ankle bone that is where you want a trouser to finish particularly if you're taking them up where you're not sure where they should sit or fit it's a really really good way to kind of fail safe your trousers um, and then we've got a simple loafer here from green shoes available in multi-tones I just like the fact it's not black or cream they've got a few yeah. different shades in that and it's got a patent finish which is more practical for days like today when I it's know. raining yeah. <laughs> it's fine soft Day. Soft day. There we go. That's what we'll call it. So we've got shoes for that occasion. Now the long line blazer. Yes, here. long line blazer are very popular, um, typically, but it can often be too oversized and swamp you and swamp the clothes you're wearing underneath it. This is what we call a hybrid between a blazer and a coat. I'd wear this as a coat. I wouldn't be putting something over it. It's absolutely ideal for this time of the year until we kind of get to like December when you just want to put a big pashmina scarf with it to warm it up further. So again, single breasted, one button, sitting nicely in underneath the waist, and just gives a finish to a, a dress. It blends with the look. It doesn't overpower it. I hate the idea of putting a coat on over what I call a lovely outfit. Yeah. You only see the coat, it ruins the shape and length and look of the outfit underneath it. Again, with the jewellery, you've kept the earrings simple because there's a little high neck here on the dress. We want to let that have its moment. And um, so a very simple huggy hoop here with some sparkle in it. Again, just something you can leave in all the time and it's going to match almost every um, option, even in a it look good with a hoodie. You know, so you've, you've got a, the versatility in that there. The rope chain, again, we're seeing here in the twist sitting nicely at the neckline and then a very simple flow with it. This dress is get that trend as is the jacket um, from Irish website uh, from Donegal. Huge selection there of dresses and pieces uh, for work and indeed weekend. This is a beautiful shape bag I feel. Kind of unusual that Gucci inspired the bamboo on it. Again 
uh, from Lally and Moo, a huge selection as we said. All leather, which I think is important when you are uh, looking for quality, if uh, leather is a, a product that you are looking to purchase, there is great options there on their site. And then we've got the rope bracelet um, in this too that just gives us that finish to blend in the set with the necklace. So again, buying in sets can be handy because you kind of know everything mixes and blends. We've gone with tights just for the practicality um, of this time of year. And if you're doing that, a sock boot like this elongates the legs. Yeah, kind of don't nice. know what's leg and what's tight and what shoe and that point pulls the eye down it just gives you that little bit of extra stretch compared to a rounded toe which is useful to keep in mind these are all from green's shoes Ooh, and we got kind of like a ruched sleeve exactly. going on. so here we've gone for the ruche or what we call um, just a waterfall that means there is no embellishment there's no zips buttons loops hooks it just falls this is very good if you're on a weight loss journey where you're between sizes you think Do you know what when i order something i'm never sure if it'll fit perfectly um so this is is a good option you always fit jackets and blazers from the shoulder that is where you look to see if it fits if there is extra space when you go like this it means it's too big if the seams are coming over the shoulder it's too small when we're looking at this we put it over the shoulder to let the fall of the dress work and complement really jackets can work well with with dresses but people tend to avoid them because they, they've bought a masculine style mm -hmm. blazer mm -hmm. and it looks at odds with the femininity of the dress unless you're going for a very directional kind of um, opposite look the, again with the jewelry really simple with the uh, kind of textured and hammered hoop there so it's a little bit bigger than the one we had before and again the link chain just a little bit of detail there high up on the neck which sits well with the neckline of this to let the print have its moment in the dress underneath but we can zoom in there on the dress you can see where it is cut just under the bust again no straight lines it's cut on a yeah. slight curve yeah. much more flattering and gives the length then because the illusion is that that's where your legs begin right up high on the waistband and flows beautifully down to that midi length again the saddle bag here really lovely shape you want something structured with this look um, rather than you know an oversized squishy one as we had earlier which worked so well with the t structure jacket and something more like again the soft boots here. then yeah, yeah really yeah. simple on Perfect. the soft boots again they're very versatile works with lots of different amazing looks. and mm. then we have one more look we yeah. do indeed so what we're doing with this look in a second which we will see is something a slightly different take on the blazer um, which we'll see in a moment again and the sleeves on that we all love a dress with a sleeve oh. Which is helpful too. So this is our back. yes last look here. We've got something a little bit different. So again, we're seeing a sleeveless blazer as being a trend for this time of the year. And again, you can wear it as we have here, with it, which is as a jacket, as a top, or indeed have it open with something underneath it, as I have on myself. It's a really simple way to to be versatile in that guy there. When we look at how we put this together, we've gone with a trouser that's a little bit more casual. Again, it's got that smartness that will work for uh, the workplace, but nice for the weekend, for an occasion, for a daytime occasion. I think this will be beautiful. Again, really simple on the bag, that camera style bag in the taupe, very luxe and blends nicely with both white, cream, navy and black. So it's a good neutral for that reason. It works hard with lots of different color palettes. Again, really simple and easy, elasticated waist on these trousers, which make it useful from a fit perspective and then a nice flow on the leg and this will be gorgeous with cream boots underneath it into, it into winter like as well. It almost looks like a maxi skirt mm. as well. Exactly, yeah. actually, uh, Dervla said that. I, I thought it was a skirt until yeah. I put it on and saw that it had that kind of culottes wide leg finish to it and then a really simple gold finish shoe with a kit and heel and the button on the front just for that little elevation on the feet. Just match with the uh, gorgeous uh, top as well. Just pick exactly. up the, Pulling the gold, gold in. detail. Yes, exactly. So gold when you've got the detail on the jacket, pull that in through every other element in the bag, shoes and jewellery to give that look of polish. So those metallic details can be useful. And okay. we've got the earrings. Thank and you well, so I've, much. Yeah, I've learned a lot. Two fingers above Two the ankle. Two fingers above the ankle. That's what I'll take that's home with me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, after the break, star of TV mega hit Blood, it's Grania Keenan. You're very welcome back. Our next guest starred as Adrian Dunbar's daughter in both series of Blood, one of the best Irish dramas of the decade. Well, now she's back as part of an all-female cast at the Gate Theatre in Dublin for the premiere of The Loved Ones. Welcome to the show, Grainne Keenan. Thank you so much for you, Grainne. Thank you. All right. So, The Loved Ones. Okay. Yes. Then we end at the Gate. Yes. What's it about? 
So it is about uh, four women. Well, it's about my husband's died uh, six months ago. I'm arriving at my mother-in-law's house to scatter his ashes, but somebody has arrived 10 minutes before with some very big revelations I won't give away. Somebody. Somebody. Yeah. Um, and there's also an American tourist in amongst the crack. Um, okay. And it's sort of an explosive weekend of revelations. And okay, and of... the person who has arrived with the revelation mm -hmm. is female? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. It's an all-female cast, actually, it's isn't it? Does that make it different to work with, a different vibe? Um, so, I mean, it's always lovely. I, I, I don't really feel it it's more just about the individuals and yeah. they're wonderful it's jane brennan and helen norton and fanta barry fantastic actors so yeah i mean okay. it's always lovely yeah <laughs> and the gate as a theater as well is pretty special isn't it it's really i mean i'm delighted i'm having the time of my life to be honest we are going to the lime tree in limerick as well okay uh, from the 21st to the 23rd so um it's good to get out as well okay it, is there kind of like a post-pandemic feel about this play shall we say it's funny you should say that <laughs> <laughs> because uh the director mentioned to me on a break, he said, I secretly think this is a post-pandemic play. Now, it's not mentioned. It's nothing to do the with it. The word C isn't there. No, yeah. God, no. It's just that there are a lot of big themes of grief and sort of the absurdity of people suddenly being gone um, and how you deal with loss. Uh, and uh, it is funny as well. Mm. <laughs> okay. Oh. Um, but uh, so in that way, I, I don't know, it kind of does speak to that, yeah. you know, how yeah. do we how do we move on from that? Yeah, because there's been a, because because of uh, of COVID. Yeah. Um, we lost an awful lot of people. Yeah. And the, and we we do funerals well in Ireland and we weren't able to. So there was a, an awful um, lot of suppressed grief. Yes. Is that what The Loved Ones is about? Suppressed there, grief. Oh. Oh, God, gotcha. yeah. Oh, God, gotcha. yeah. There's a lot of... Certainly, my character is keeping the grief at bay. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's very much about that. Um, and it's funny you should say that, because in the play, there's a mention of the funeral, and it didn't go well. We don't know what happened, but it did not go well. Yeah. Um, so. When you compare um, acting in the gate, and it's quite, a, even though it's, it's quite a few people, it's very intimate as well when you're in there and the audience is very close to you. But when you compare um, what you do there to what you do on screen, I mean, you were in both series, the mega hit uh, Blood, of course, that was here on Virgin Media. Yeah. Um, it's a different, it's a completely different game, isn't it? And oh, yeah. how, do you, how do you change gears between the two? I, I, it's, it's funny, there are moments when you're on set, though, when, when, the atmosphere is really thick, where you do almost think of the crew as your audience yeah. sometimes. Um, and there's a similarity in that you've always got to keep your audience in your mind when you're rehearsing for a play, because it's just a sort of cocooned atmosphere. Um, but you always have to keep in mind, OK, how's this going to read to everybody who comes in? Um, so there's an element to which they're similar. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, the size of what you're doing yeah. is so different between theatre and TV. Um, but at the heart of it, it is the same thing. It's but all about the acting connection. is quieter, I suppose. Much it's not quieter. as projected, but it's still you still have to get the same kind of emotions across. Exactly. exactly. Um, what was it like working with the legend that is Adrian Dunbar? I'd say that was some crack. <laughs> it was absolutely crack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's fantastic. He's he uh, he just brings a great atmosphere to the set. He's very playful, but knows when to be serious. It's just always great yeah. to have people like that around. Just switches on when yeah. they yeah. say, go, go. action. Exactly. Yeah. No, no, we, we, we've had him on the show a couple of times. Yeah. And, yeah, he, he's always great, great fun. Yeah, he's yeah. great fun. <laughs> but when you're making something like Blood, you do need oh, the, yeah. Yeah, th that little bit of humour in between takes. Oh, the levity, yeah. yeah. I mean, those kind of shows sometimes can be even funnier offset because yeah. you really need to balance out the heavy yeah, I, 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 I remember the first series of Blood and all our thoughts were going in one direction yes. <laughs> until that big da, da, twist da. that occurred. Oh, if you haven't seen it, you need to watch it. Yeah, it's that, that, As it's running and it's getting an awful lot of attention, it's very difficult to keep your mouth shut when people oh, are asking yeah. you Oh, yeah, because my <laughs> parents were very like, who is it? You couldn't <laughs> even tell your parents. Oh, no, no. I don't want to ruin it. <laughs>
Um, <laughs> so, uh, oh yeah, it is. I've gotten quite good at that actually, at really? kind of keeping stum. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Kind of, oh, no, I suppose no, you kind no. of have to as an actor. Well, it forces my friends and family to watch it then. So, you see? Yeah. Okay. You're not going to get the inside okay, skinny. But, uh, but you're from a, uh, an acting family. Yeah. Yeah, your yeah. Brother and sister. My yeah. brother and sister. Yeah. Oh, I'd say the fighting for attention when you're growing up was something <laughs> chronic. <laughs> Who won? <laughs> yeah. There probably was. Probably me fighting more because I was the youngest. Oh, so of course. there's always a hello. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, kind of quite low key actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. So do you ever have like competition competition between you? Not like, I have been in a series in 65 territories. Ha ha ha. Throw that out at Christmas time. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. It's sort of. Um, what's nice is that it's such an odd way of life. So it's lovely in the family to have people who just totally get it, get it yeah. and you don't have to explain anything. Um, and in terms of competition, there's so much competition in the industry anyway. So you don't need it with your siblings, do you? Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. There was a little bit. There, there was, uh, you know, there was no need for method acting when it came to the Unforgiven because you were playing. Oh gosh. Yeah. Opposite your sister <laughs> yes, yes. as the character's sister. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That yeah, sounds like that a nightmare for me. I have five <laughs> sisters. I hate it. I was good crack. <laughs> I'm sure it was. You never get over something like that. Yeah. Listen, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Yes. My sister's going to kill me now. Yeah. There you that. go. <laughs> and it's a pleasure, as always, to talk to you. To and um, you. if you haven't seen Blood, you can catch up with it. I think it's on the player now. Oh, and of course. Yeah, yeah. and the, remember, there's two series. Though. Yeah. Uh, the Loved Ones, by the way, uh, will run from October 1st at the gate, and tickets are available from gatetheatre.ie. Now we're back after this short break. Don't go anywhere. My phone's going to blow up now. Let's check in your morning papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. It leads with TikTok fined 345 million euro over child privacy. They write the Chinese-owned app incentivised children to skip privacy settings. The Irish regulator finds. The examiner also leads with TikTok falls to danger to Irish children. The story continues. TikTok's failure to safety, ha safely handle the data of children represents a clear danger to a large number of Irish children, campaigners have claimed. The front page of the Irish Independent uh, leads with the headline, New Mortgage Relief Plan to Ease Pressure of Spiralling Interest Rates. Uh, they report struggling mortgage holders are in line for short-term financial support to meet their interest repayments as the government comes under mounting pressure to respond to the latest ECB rate rise in next month's budget. Moving on to the tabloids now, the Daily Mail leads with contagion of court dodgers over TV licence. The paper writes, judge who previously criticised freeloaders and RTE order Gardaí to arrest defaulters who failed to turn up for hearings. The mirror goes with Paddy Crack writing Patrick Kilty brought the fun back to RTE last night as he opened his first Late Late Show with a joke-filled monologue about the payments crisis. The Star also leads with this story going with the headline Host with the Roast. The paper writes Patrick Kilty repeatedly poked fun at the RTE secret payment scandal and former host Ryan Tuberty during his opening monologue last night. And then we have The Sun with the headline More the Merrier. The story continues uh, revealing that Christy Moore is sitting on more than two million amid a mighty cash, cash surge. And the Herald leads with I leave home to refugees. It writes that a Dublin old age pensioner who took in a Ukrainian family wants them to stay on in his home after he's gone. All right. Now, a bunch of attacks in and I have to say, Martin, they're all in your favour over Christmas. We love hearing from you on 089 611 And we're talking about Christmas today because it's 100 days to go. Audrey says, no, not too early to bring Christmas holidays in. I have all my grandchildren's Xmas PJs, slippers, house clothes wow. and gifts headed out to Spain for them already. Wow. Audrey, that is some work. Catherine says, I worked in retail for 32 years until two years ago. Always loved the vibes of Christmas. You must have the patience of Job. Yes, yeah, you must, you must. <laughs> all right, uh, Laura says, I've started doing all my Christmas shopping online to avoid the music. Music cheers you up. Needless to say, I'm not delighted by the constant Christmas creep further as it creeps further back into the year. Halloween can't even save us anymore. <laughs> and Frank says, I too, did you read that one? Frank's one. No. I too love Christmas. The reason being when I was younger, I worked for 19 years. Christmas days and Stephen's days, I miss the kids getting their presents from Santa. So now it ah. seems extra special to me. And the Christmas theme keeps going on. Do you know what I think? I think maybe if I had 
like nieces or nephews, I'd enjoy it more. Because I feel like when you see the excitement from kids, that probably brings you a bit more joy. But like like Frank, like my mom works in retail, I worked in retail, so no one was really, at Christmas Eve, you're flat out, Stephen's Day, you're back out. So we, you're, you not, see, you're not getting tipsy. I don't, I don't think shops should open on St. Stephen's Day. I agree, I, I agree. I really think, that for just for those two days, stay but shut. But that's because the sales start then. I think it's different yeah. to but the country in the city. 24 hours later. No, in fairness, in the country, Stephen's night is a big, it's a big night and then Stephen's Day is the big sales day. But it, I, I think it's not as big a deal in, in Dublin, well, is, is it? Is Stephen's Day not the Ren Day? No. Well, it might be, but not really. But I feel like hopefully we're moving opinion. to online shopping, maybe maybe some some stores will close this year. Uh, you did mention your <laughs> coffee cream. Liz, not my coffee cream, I hate it. <laughs> Liz says, I have to say, I do love the coffee cream sweet. It's among my favourite sweets, and I really do miss them. Wouldn't mind getting rid of the orange or strawberry cream. Oh, They're too yes. sweet what? for my taste. I love I orange agree. and strawberry cream. No. Okay, hands up if you do not like strawberry or orange. Uh, strawberry I'm not a fan of. No. Orange, yes. Oh. The orange cream I do. The question like. is, do you like mince pies? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all the yeah. way. But I tell you what, I, I tell you what, I don't think they should be on shelves yet, and they are. In a lot of shops, they're already there. Uh, and you got to eat them before the middle of October, otherwise they're gone off. So what's the point? <laughs> Hello? Lovely. Anyway, we'd love to know your thoughts. 0896 treble one treble one as we're 100 days away from the big day. After the break, fans of true crime in history will both love this. It's a history of some of Ireland's most notorious murders. Stay with us. You're very welcome back. Ireland has undergone some massive changes over the last two centuries and our next guest has mapped these changes through the lens of 18 historical murders in his latest book. Here now to tell us more is the Irish History Podcast, Finn Dwyer. You're very welcome to Thanks the show. Very much. And congratulations are in order because your latest book, which is your third, was yeah. just re released this week. Um, so yeah, tell us a bit about the premise of the book. Yeah, so I suppose, uh, I think murder has appeal. Uh, I think people were always kind of intrigued by it, I suppose it's in ways the ultimate taboo. But uh, it's also really useful to the historian because yeah. you know we take, we take a huge interest obviously in the aftermath of a murder. People who are often, not really, you know, often relegated to the margins of history suddenly can become the focus. Uh, you know, and we get a huge amount of records about their lives, the, the lives they lived, the relationships they had with other people. And I thought that might be an interesting way to explore the past because we'd have these very personal um, insights into key moments that, you know, I think we've all heard the stories of people like, you know, Michael Collins or Eamon de Valera. And I suppose I wanted to tell it maybe from the, the ground up rather than uh, the top down. Is it like what sparked the idea in the first place kind of to explore Irish history through the societal reaction to these murders? Um, well, I've been making a podcast for the last 13 years and along the way, you know, you'd come across in archives or whatever, you'd come across murders and, you know, I'd I would have kept record of them. And at the same time, I was thinking about I've all, the idea of the, 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 I suppose, the changes over the last two centuries and how different we are from our ancestors and even like you know, our grandparents or great grandparents. And as you go back, there's a huge difference in just very basic things about life and how they interacted with the world around them. And I suppose through these murders and actually a, a lot of the time, the reaction to them or the reasons why they took place yeah. really it's a great mechanism to tease some of this out. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like, so you wouldn't really say it's it's true crime, but we are covering crimes that took place over a certain period of time. Is there an example you could share with us of one of the crimes that took place in your new book? Yeah, I think there's a, a case that, that has stood out, uh, not just to myself, but to a lot of people who, who've read it, is the case of a woman, Mary Hart, who was killed in the 1890s. And her death, I think, touches on so many things that are um, central to Irish life right up to the present. Um, ultimately, she fell victim to a person with severe mental health problems. But it's not really about that person to, to, to one degree or another. Um, it's about the way mental health was treated at the yeah. time. People were very well aware in the community that uh, the person had very serious problems, but his own mother, sorry, I should say it, it was her son who ultimately killed her, but he, she, she wanted to keep him at home because she was afraid of sending him to an asylum because they had such a notorious reputation and a well-earned one at the time. And there was huge levels of incarceration in asylums and people often just kind of disappeared into this asylum system. Yeah. So she tried to keep him at home, tried to look after him and ultimately, Let you know, she wasn't able, yes. like, you know. 
Chapter 7 on emigration, mm. that story, I think, is is quite interesting and kind of really reflective of the way Ireland was at the time. Can you tell us that? Yeah, that, that revolves around a murder that, that, that actually took place in Cincinnati in the US. And I suppose that's inevitable when you talk about Irish history. Because, because the diaspora is so huge. Yeah, and like, like right through the 19th century, even before the Great Hunger, huge numbers of Irish people were living overseas. Like one in seven Irish people was living overseas by 1845. And, by 1900, it's two and five, or two and five, um, and but so it's not surprising that a murder involving Irish people would take place in Cincinnati. But that case in particular, which involves a woman who is murdered by a priest who is her lover, um, touches on so many different aspects. I suppose of clerical abuse because uh, the church certainly uh, sat on its hands in terms of um, the way it had treated abuse in the community in in um, Sligo at the time, and then also just a lot of the dynamics around the way women were treated, particularly in the aftermath. Yeah. She was a young woman murdered in a street in Cincinnati by this... So she'd left, she'd left Ireland? She'd left Ireland. The two had sparked up a relationship. Um, obviously, we don't know the, too much of the details of the yeah. relationship. You'd have to suspect, though, there's a, a degree of... Um, there's a power imbalance, at yes, the very yeah, least. Obviously, he's a priest in a community mm -hmm. with a huge amount of influence and power. She goes to America. He follows her out there. She falls pregnant, but at the same time, he's somewhat, he seems to think that he can remain a priest and that she'll just remain his mistress. Mm -hmm. And this woman, Molly Gilmartin was her name, is very adamant that she doesn't want that. She wants him to leave the priesthood and maybe they'd go to California mm -hmm. or somewhere where there's not such big Irish communities and maybe start again. He doesn't do this and ultimately he shoots her dead in the street in Cincinnati where she had been living kind of separate from him uh, for a couple of months uh, with relations of hers. He had tracked her down. And shot Stalked her. Stalked her in a, a mm. Oh, very much so. And like in the days up to it, rented a, 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 a house close to where she was living and was monitoring her. And yeah, it's very, you know, the strong echoes into the present yeah. um, of that case. And then just wider um, emigration at the time. You can see as they travel through the US, they're going to relatively small cities in, in the northeast of the US, but they're meeting people that they know yeah. from home. And like they're writing letters back to Ireland, kind of almost gossip letters about yeah, girls kissing yeah. boys and Why is father all greedy with your yeah, wife? Yeah, yeah, just yeah, goes yeah. to show like the tightness of the community. I yeah, mean it's a really yeah. original way of just s describing societal times um, through murder. But we do have to mention your podcast. We touched yeah. on it lightly. I mean because it is doing great. It boasts millions of downloads. You have a global listenership. Yep. What sort of sparked the idea of this podcast? Because you did start it before the market of podcasting was oversaturated. Like today it's <laughs> you know everyone has a podcast. This is doing great. Tell us how it started. Yeah, so I started making the podcast back in 2010 when the first conversation you'd have with someone was you'd tell them what a podcast <laughs> was. Um, it started, yeah, I'd been working in archaeology for years and kind of around the recession of 2008-9, archaeology kind of almost ceased to exist for a while, so there wasn't a lot of work going. And at the same time, I developed a chronic illness, so I had a lot of time on my hands. And initially, I just started making a podcast. I've always had a, an interest in history. And I started making a podcast just to, for something to do. You know, like I had a lot, as I say, I had a lot of time on my hands. And then slowly, I suppose, as podcasting developed, um, I was, I suppose, well positioned by, you know, 2015, 16, as podcasting really began to take off. Uh, the show was kind of well positioned to, to grow. And then because Irish history also then would have a attraction, say, among the diaspora, particularly in the US, mm. um, it's been able to grow outside of Ireland as well. Whereas I suppose some shows that would be more kind of maybe rooted to Ireland yeah. wouldn't as ha have that audience outside the country. But there's a fascination universally as well with with, um, with Irish history and of course, as you know, from mur with murders as well. But I love the, 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 one of the quotes in the notes that I had to hang up my boots for and I couldn't be Indiana Jones anymore <laughs> <laughs> with the archaeology. Because I suppose, because you did do Greek and Roman civilization, wasn't that, and archaeology. Yeah, yeah, so not yeah. the most, uh, when the, the crash happened, probably wasn't the, the easiest time to get employed. No, it's not exactly when you have that on your CV. It's not, <laughs> it's, it's not, they're not jump out uh, qualifications, I don't think. But it must be great being able to do that though. Something you love and you're fascinated with and now it's literally your bread and butter and it's global. I mean, yeah. the sense of achievement must be great. Oh, it's great, yeah. Like to be able to work at something you love, I think is like, it's, it's rare enough. Like, you know, a lot of people just yeah. have to get on and maybe yeah. don't enjoy work. But the know? dedication shows, I just tell us quickly about the famine diet that you underwent for this podcast. Yeah, I suppose one thing that people are often surprised at is the amount of potatoes that people ate just on the eve of the famine. And for men, it would be 12 to 14 pounds. A day. Really, a day. A day, yeah. Pounds of potatoes a day. Yeah, that's right, 60 I have one potatoes. baked potato and I feel guilty for <laughs> carb loading anyway. Yeah. And, you know, I suppose this provoked cur curiosity. And I, um, I interviewed a culinary historian, Dr. Regina Sexton in UCC. And then I actually tried 
the diet myself and like uh, to say it's bland doesn't go half <laughs> uh, it doesn't explain it wow. how did you it, feel after it uh it, i didn't eat potatoes for a while yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, did you get no, not to, like you know, like by like you, only, you can't eat sixty. Like it's just it's impossible. Like, you know, <laughs> so like, you didn't have sixty potatoes. I, like, Delighted to hear it. I, I gave up. Like you know, I just couldn't physically eat sixty. <laughs> just more potatoes. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. It's a pleasure so talking to you. Now, a lethal legacy, a history of Ireland in eighteen murders, is available now in any good bookstore. After the break, it's Mexican Independence Day. Vamos to the kitchen. Off you go. <laughs> Welcome back. Today marks Mexican Independence Day, celebrating Mexico's declaration of independence from Spain over 200 years ago. There's parties, there's parades, there's concerts, and get this, there's soup. I think so. <laughs> Lily Ramirez, foreign from Picadol, Mexican, is here to help us celebrate the day. Lily, what is cooking? And Viva Mexico! Thank you. Viva Mexico, yes. This is a huge day for Mexicans. We start... The official celebrations start uh, on the 15 at night. Yeah. And we do uh, a thing called El Grito. So we shout, Viva Mexico, Viva Mexico. And we kind of... Uh, shout hooray to all of the heroes of Mexican independence. There were quite a few because yeah. the War of Independence lasted 11 years, but we celebrate the rising. Yeah. Okay. And then 11 years later, uh, we finally got our independence. But it's a great day in Mexico. Loads of, uh, it's a very colorful celebration and there is a lot of food. Um, I chose this particular dish because it's quite iconic mm -hmm. uh, and it's probably the easiest one to make that doesn't require a uh, huge preparation. I do need an extra hand. Oh, um, fair enough. And I'm looking at right, you, right, Martin. I just know it's me. I just know it's me. <laughs> now, you did tell us a really interesting point because we're using pork for this dish, but back in the day, you said the Aztecs used what? Yeah, so meat? the... Um, this is an Aztec soup, right? right. And it was made uh, originally with the thigh of a prisoner oh, that they uh, sacrificed. Uh, uh, well, it was, um, She's it was, uh, talking oh traditional Mexican cooking. <laughs> And I, I still want my legs. Uh, stop, um, I promise you. So we're going to start with a stock. Uh, obviously, this is pre-made because we don't have enough time. Yeah. But what I did is I got delicious Irish pork um, shoulder, cut it into little chunks, put it in plenty of water, because you're making a stock. Yeah. This is the base of your soup. And I, all I did was I add a big chunk of garlic yeah. and a whole head of garlic, actually, on peel. OK. Uh, water and a bit of salt and our meat. And your job, Martin, is to fish that... Uh, a couple of chunks of that delicious meat and shred them for me. Shred it, okay. Uh, because they're going to go at the bottom of our plate, okay. right? Uh, the basis of pozole is something called hominy. Um, it is, this is a, a Mexican corn, a very meaty type of this corn. This already fallen apart. I know, yeah, because it's been wow, cooked so for tender. about uh, two and a half hours. Okay. Wow. Um, you want it really soft, falling apart. Yeah, um, yeah well, it's doing that. Brilliant. And that's the garlic. We don't need to do that one. Oh, yeah, leave that there. Yeah, yeah you're all right there. Um, I'd say that's, that's loads, Martin. Are you Is sure you... this isn't some fella that yeah. came knocking on the door <laughs> the other day trying I'm, to sell I'm going to never leave that one out. Um, so, um, for... Obviously, it's Mexican food, so we need, uh, we need chilli. So, I... Um, I have two different types of Mexican dry chilies there. I have something called cascabel, which is quite leathery, very uh, subtle in heat. And then we have guajillo, which is uh, also um, kind of a fruity type of chili. Okay. These chilies would add a little bit of heat because the soup is has to be um, yes. a little bit of, uh, you know, spicy enough. So are you soaking them in just hot water? This is just, uh, I took the seeds out and the stems and we can see the seeds all here yeah. uh, gather. And I am boiling them for about five minutes, okay. you know. Okay. Um, I like to boil chilies because I think you've never... You, you don't know where these chilies have been, who's handled them, in which conditions they've been stored. <laughs> yeah. so Whose ster toy they were on. <laughs> <laughs> so sterilising, it's an important thing, right? So we're rehydrating and sterilising. And we want big bubbles with these, right? OK, okay well, um, take the fat out of this, Lee. Yes, yes, please. Okay. You can put it back in the pot. It won't, it won't kill there us. There it goes. Um, if you if your butcher leaves the skin on, 
cook it with the skin because there's a lot of flavor in yeah. it. And then yeah. just remove it um, when, when the stock is done. Um, I'd say that's loads, Martin. Oh, really? So your next, your next task is to get a little bit of meat in those two little blue dishes. Pozole builds up, so you have the hot, uh, the hot heat. Okay. Yeah. So when your stock is ready and you fish out the garlic and you shredded the meat, then we need to add our hominy, okay. our um, that's corn. The, the kind of meaty textured corn. Meaty corn. It's yeah. a very fat corn and we need to... Um, this is pre-cooked. It, it comes in a tin, but you can buy it dry as well. Yeah. Uh, we sell it uh, pre-cooked because I'm a great believer of choosing your battles, right? <laughs> um, this, will, this will speed up the process quite a lot. Um, we're going to simmer that for about... 20 minutes to half an hour should be enough, but you can do it longer. And if you do buy a dry one, you start cooking it almost at the same time as you cook the meat. Okay. So it kind of bursts. It's very meaty, very nutritious, really, really tasty. Um, so that's our stock with the corn um, in it. It's done, love, chef. Done. That is perfect. So the next thing is when your chilies are on, we're going to add into our blender a nice uh, garlic, uh, garlic clove. clove quite a bit, about two tablespoons of Mexican oregano. Mm -hmm. Mexican oregano is the cousin of the thyme. So it okay. has a different flavor to, um, can I have the tongs there, Martin? Of course you can. To regular oregano. Um, the Mediterranean oregano that we use in Europe is a cousin of the mint. And Mexican oregano is a cousin of the thyme, so it tastes quite different. We're going to fish out our soft, delicious little chilies. We don't want that water. I always think and that And they'll probably a bit blend manky. a lot easier now that they're softer, yes, right? Yes, yeah. You wouldn't really do it without uh, rehydrating the chilies. It's important. The texture of your sauce um, is going to change, right? So I'm going to add um, my chilies and I'm going to blend them with a little bit of that stock. Now, with how spicy this dish is going to be, is that determined by how many chilies we blend right now? Like, could you add a bit more or less if you exactly. wanted to? Exactly. Now, this is not meant to be something that you can't, you know... Handle. Handle, <laughs> right? <laughs> My mummy made the one I made earlier. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, because she's visiting and... Oh, she, family in, are home. Yes, oh, all brilliant. my family. And my little sister sitting in the green room. Um, oh, so, so you're competing with Mama's dish. Oh, my Ooh. God, yes. <laughs> There's going to be big... Um, okay, you're just... tasting Mama's dish. Oh, am I? Okay, yeah. okay. So that's going to be blended, and I'm going to start serving um, serving the pozole for, for you to taste okay, it, because okay. we're a bit pressed for time, I, I think. OK, now, it doesn't matter how good yours is, it will never be as good as your mother's. <laughs> Damn, okay. I think you're right, yeah. yeah. No, no. Although, I have to say, though, I did say to Mommy yesterday, I think this is a little bit hotter than the one, maybe because I've been here 23 years. Yeah. I'm kind of more gentle with my chilli because my husband, Alan, um, is uh, Irish and after 20 years, he can, he can do chilli, but not as much. So now it's the topping. So this is what makes this soup so delicious. Okay. We need white cabbage, some radishes, a bit of raw onion chopped, mm -hmm. squeeze of lime juice, and Bob's your uncle. Ready to go. All yeah. right. So the... start topping yours, Marshall. Okay, sure, yeah. Bit of everything. A little bit of everything. And you can see in this one, the corn has... Um... So what you say is here? Uh, that's salsa, but I don't think you need no, that. No, you won't need that. No, with mummies. Uh, you can... Plenty of that, a bit of onion, some radishes. Oh, don't... So don't be lime shy. Lime juice. Don't okay. be shy. Okay. Um, so I'm putting there the corn and the soup. And when you add the the dry chilies to the soup, this is the colour that the soup yeah. gets. It gives a nice nice red red colour. Yeah, it? it's a it's a reddish soup. Uh, obviously, if you're worried about chilies, maybe do half of the chilies. But it's nice to kind of bring down the heat of the chili with the toppings, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. So do we have enough? Um, I'm going to do yours. I, I didn't go mad yeah. with the onions because I'm hoping to get kissed. Twice, well, it's you know? true, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, like, a true Mexican would be generous with the size. onions. <laughs> I'll be sleeping out with the dog. <laughs> I'm going to put a few of these for Katya. And are you ready to taste? Well, I'm ready to right, taste. let's I'm do a taste yeah. test. I like... Yeah, I'm going to do some lime juice for you, Katya. Lovely. It's all in the toppings. OK. There oh you my go. God. And obviously, it's soup, so... It's soup, so be careful. 
Um, I love, love, love this soup. And a lot of Mexicans, we do pozole, we do um, chiles en nogada, which is also very traditional, but they're quite complicated to make. Um, I think this is a great thing that you can pre-make and then just enjoy it with the family, with all the fresh toppings. Mm -hmm. um, That's really, really lovely. Mm, Thank that's you. That's gorgeous. Really, really. So, nice. thumbs up for mommy. Yeah, thumbs up. <laughs> thumbs up for mommy. <laughs> and for teaching Lily this wonderful recipe. Full recipe details are available on our website, as always, or you can find out more from Lily at her website, picadomexican.com. Okay, still to come, we're catching up with comedian turned playwright Martin Beans Ward. We're back after this break. Viva Mexico! Viva Mexico! Viva Mexico! <laughs> kid. Kind of have to sort of race the Silk Road Rally. That race is no holds barred. 200 miles per hour for four days straight across unforgiving terrain against the craziest drivers in the world. I know! How am I going to beat the best racer in the world? All right, kid. Listen. You got everything you need, but you and me together... There ain't nothing we can't do. Whoa. Okay, let's see what you got. Welcome back. Our next guest is a highly respected actor and comedian who started his career getting rave reviews from the likes of Tommy Tiernan and Jez Bishop. Well, now he's taken to the stage with his one-man show, Martin Beans Ward joins us. But first, let's get a look at him in action. What a great memory I have. Happy times. It was only when I looked to the windowsill when I saw a glass with two toothbrushes it was only then that I realized the gravity of the situation. It was something about those two toothbrushes that represented the manifestation of a, a relationship, of life. Because one of those toothbrushes was used for the last time yesterday. There's something about that. It just gets me. Right, you're very welcome to the show. I, I, I noticed that while, while Elaine and I were looking at that, you were looking to the heavens. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that was actually a work in progress that I did. That was the very first time I, I, I did any form of theatre. And before I wrote this play, I had never seen theatre. I never watched yeah, the, ne never watched theatre before this. And the reason why I'm laughing there is because, uh, well, you can see that I went, so there's, there's one particular line that when you write it, it sounds lovely. Mm. Two toothbrushes. Yeah. But what you're saying is like two toothbrushes. Yeah. So, so I've yeah. changed that now, so it's a pair of toothbrushes, so it's a little bit easier <laughs> to say. And the reason why I'm laughing is because, um, so that was the first work in progress. That was done dur during um, COVID times for the Dublin Theatre Festival as yeah. a work in progress. And it was filmed at the Town Hall Theatre in Galway, but there was no one in the audience. So there was no, as a comedian, you're used to getting that yeah. audience yeah. reaction mm. straight away. Um, and I'm also looking at it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't look like I've done comedy before. It's very serious, that scene. Mm. But the actual play overall is a dark comedy. And it's yeah. kind of, it's very, it's very much an Irish take on, on the funeral and the wake. You're always going to have these people who's going to be telling the jokes around the side of the house. You're going to have the people crying. You're going to have the people coming up giving hugs and other people making sandwiches. Everyone plays a role at yeah. an Irish funeral. And it's about paying homage to all of those people. Yeah. Um, when you... Like when you decided to write the play, um, you said you'd never actually seen the theatre before. I mean, so how did you go about actually the structure of it and knowing what to do, I'm, the research-wise? I literally sat down to write a story. That's it's just your story. No, not my story, no. The story that you wanted to tell. <laughs> the sorry, story that I wanted yeah. to tell, yeah. And there's something, I, I suppose this sparks off from a while back when I started writing, again during COVID. I lost all of my shows. I had, I had a lot of sold out shows in comedy. And for the first time in my career, I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna make a bit of, bit of a living here doing this. Because it's, it's incredibly difficult to make a living in comedy. And to sell out your shows months in advance was a massive thing for me yeah, in my yeah. career. And then along comes the lockdown. And everyone was saying, oh, it'll be grand. Sure, look, we just rescheduled them. They, they, they never came. So there were 
all cancelled. And I was like, I put all my eggs into one basket. What, are, what other types of expressionism do I like? What other types of creativity do I like? And I liked writing. Mm. So I wrote an article about my grandmother. Mm -hmm. It was actually I remember a column. that one actually, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it was just after, she, so she had died in just at the, uh, before the, the pandemic kind of took hold. Um, she died in February 2020. And then, of course, we started seeing the cases then from March onwards. And I wrote that as a column for the Dublin Inquirer. Mm -hmm. And then the Irish Times saw it and said, oh, we'd like to reprint it. And I was like, if you want to pay me off for a go. second time, go off it, you lads, you know. And I was just thinking, Ash, I, I'm not going to be a journalist, right? Like, that. I had no real desire. But it was the writing side of it. And then when I wrote that, I found myself kind of delving into the more personal and really kind of expressing myself on a page, which you cannot do with comedy, because comedy only has one goal. Make people laugh. Make you laugh, make yeah. you laugh. The beautiful part about theatre, and I'm already sounding like a thespian, the way I'm speaking <laughs> right now. You can tell I've been indoctrinated, you know. Um, wait but, for the Irish Times yeah, now. But, uh, but the beautiful thing about theatre is that it, you're allowed to make them laugh, but also you're allowed to evoke other emotions. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in order to kind of really encapsulate yourself within a story, you have to be able to play on all the emotions. And that's, that's what I find beautiful about theatre. Yeah. yeah, but as some other comedians now, they try to marry both. I mean, if we look at, a, a, I think like Nanette, but Hannah Gatsby, she, she kind of did the, both comedy and tragedy at the same time. But that's, that's not for you. You feel that you have to kind of separate them out oh, of it. Oh, let me stop you there, Elaine. Oh. <laughs> well, let me stop you there. Uh, we, we will not have this, kind of, this form of misinformation. My, it's dark comedy, actually. Yeah. So it, it is a, there is a bit of cracking. But if you think about it, think about an Irish funeral. You will have, like there's a scene there where I'm talking about, and we have the men with the laugh and faces, with the yeah. red noses and the drink the night before. Yeah. Yeah. laughing around the side of the house yeah. because we're men we don't know what to do with emotion so we tell jokes yeah. Yeah. and that's very true to form mm -hmm. and you'll always have the people that be, could be extended family or friends of the family and their role is to break that tension they have a very specific role and it's an unwritten role and that's the thing about funerals and, and bereavement that whether we like it or not we will have a role to play mm -hmm. and that's a stage that we all have to stand on it is a performance that we all have to go through. And that's what I wanted to get with this. So the laughs are just as important as the tears. Oh, but, but I, we were only saying in, in the last hour with Grania that we, I, as Irish, we do funerals well. And we, we, but we do. The, the, you know, they say the, lad, the, the, the difference between an Irish wedding and an Irish funeral is that there's probably one less drunk at the funeral. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so you have tapped into that with this. I, I'm just fascinated with the fact that you never saw a play and yet you've written one. But that I mean, is. Okay, what is it? Look, it's not a complicated thing. Let's, let's, let's not beat around the bush. So says you who wrote one just like that. Yeah but, <laughs> yeah, but okay, so what am I writing from? I'm writing from observation. As a comedian, that's what we do anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and I would encourage everyone watching, if an idiot like me can write a play, and I mean this no, sincerely. No, you're doing yourself a massive disservice. No, I'm not doing myself a disservice. I want the viewers to know that this is not some area of the arts that's exclusive. If, if somebody has a story to tell, I would encourage each and every person to start writing it down. Because even if it's only a monologue form, even if it's only a 15 minute thing, even if you're never going to perform it, write it, create it and express yourself. Because the Irish arts really needs that from every corner of Irish society. It is no longer an exclusive club for a certain demographic of people in Ireland. The arts is meant to be there for everybody. Oh, yeah. And that's the message I want to get when out. When you started out in comedy, I mean, uh, it was quite a, a challenge for you doing that anyway. And then from, move from, from that to, to where you are now, would you ever think that has it been an easy, easier path for you now since did comedy pave the way for this, or was it difficult to get your break in comedy tell you because what. of everything? <laughs> Let me tell you what comedy does for you. What? Comedy, com <laughs> right? Here com we go. Com com comedy, comedy gets you to become comfortable with dying on your hole several times over and doing really, <laughs> really, really shite gigs. Yeah. And once you get that, you, what, what have you got to fear? What? Yeah. Falling on the stage again. So comedy is great for that, but also comedy is fantastic for connecting with the audience. And if you can do that within theatre, which is what I'm doing, I'm not saying I know what you should do in theatre, mm -hmm. but for my particular 
performance in theatre. It's about connecting with the audience and for the audience to take away something from that. And you've done that uh, with comedy as well. Um, you, you connect with people, but you also, before we came in there, you said you don't pull up the ladder behind you in comedy, and you haven't done that. Not a hope, no. And, and not just comedy, in, in everything that I do. I, I've, I formed this mantra, because look, I'm doing really well. I'm doing really well. I am so grateful for everything that I have. But I also feel as though I might be stealing opportunities from other people, not just people from my community, but Irish people in general. I have so many friends and I have gone to so many shows since writing mine. And I've seen all of these fantastic and really talented people, really talented writers, who don't have the same, I suppose, network of connections that I might have mm. garnered over the years. And I'm looking at them wasting away. You know, I, I know people during COVID who had to give up either singing or, you know, they were writing a play and they had to stop because they had to take on a job. And then, you know, three or four years passes yeah. and all of a sudden they're kind of, they're in a rush and they may not, n not ever have the opportunity again. So, yeah, it's incredibly important, not just for me, for everybody, to not pull that ladder up behind you. Because it's, it's so hard to get to the top. The last thing you want is for people, and I'm not at the top, by the way, they haven't given yeah, me a Saturday night <laughs> talk show yet. So I up anyway. But I'm, I'm on the way, I'm on the way. Um, and, and I'm very grateful for that, but I'd be very grateful for every other performer like myself to not pull that ladder up behind yeah, because well, somebody, so, somebody sent the ladder down for you, so you need to send it down for the next person. Uh, no one sent the ladder. I, I broke in the top window. That's what I did. <laughs> yeah. So, but, 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 but just like that, even with theatre, like I've, I've got a fantastic group of mentors. You know, like, like Willie White from the Dublin Theatre yeah. Festival. He's yeah, the whole reason that I've yeah. even pursued all of this and, and to instill that belief in me that I can go beyond just being, being just a comedian. Okay. okay, well, comedians make great actors. Tom Hanks, yeah. fantastic Tommy actor. Tommy yeah, there you go. brilliant actors. Absolutely. Thank you because so much of their timing. for joining and us on the play. show today. Thank you very, make sure you come to the play. Yeah, of course, and of course, if you'd like to see uh, Martin Lee's one-man show, The Dead House, ticket information is available at dublintheatrefestival.ie and you can keep up with him on his Instagram and Twitter at Martin Beans. Yeah, there's more Island AM on the way after this quick break. Right, let's take a last check in your morning papers, uh, starting with the Irish Times, who they lead with TikTok, fined €345 million Euro over child privacy. They write the Chinese-owned app incentivised children to skip privacy settings, the Irish regulator found. The examiner also leads with TikTok faults, a danger to Irish children. The story continues. TikTok's failure to safely handle the data of children represents a clear danger to a large number of Irish children, campaigners have claimed. The front page of the Irish Independent leads with the headline New Mortgage Relief Plan to Ease the Pressure of Spiralling Interest Rates. They report struggling mortgage holders are in line for short-term financial support to meet their interest repayments as the government comes, comes under mounting pressure to respond to the latest ECB rate rise in next month's budget. Moving on to the tabloids now, the Daily Mail leads with contagion of court dodgers over TV licence. The paper writes, judge who previously criticised freeloaders and RTE order Gardaí to arrest defaulters who failed to turn up for hearings. Uh, the Mirror goes with Paddy Crack, writing Patrick Kilty brought the fun back to RTE last night as he opened his first Late Late Show with a joke-filled monologue about the payments crisis. The star also leads with this story, going with the headline Host with the Rose. The paper writes Patrick Keelty repeatedly poked fun at the RTE secret payment scandal and former host Ryan Tuberty during his opening monologue last night. Then we have The Sun with the headline More the Merrier. The story continues uh, saying Christy Moore is sitting on more than two million amid a mighty cash surge. And the Herald leads with I Leave Home to Refugees, writes that a Dublin old age pensioner who took in a Ukrainian family wants them to stay on in his home after he's gone. You lot have been sending in a bunch of texts and we're going through them now. Christmas tax. Orla it's says, 100 days. It's I'm 100 days it's, to I'm go. I'm not saying get your decorations out. I'm just saying <laughs> it's 100 days to go. I, literally, I can, I can see the Santa Claus hat being produced and you're bopping around the place next week. Oh, I'd say come November, working with you, I'll turn into Elf himself. 
Yeah. 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 You'll, you'll have that effect on me. Orla says, love Christmas, but not to be advertised before Halloween. Agree, no. shops should be, shouldn't be open on Christmas, on St. Stephen's Day. I also have a son-in-law who likes the orange and strawberry chocolates, cuts down the food waste. She's covering all the things we've discussed today, Orla. Yeah. Thanks, Orla. I've been Orla. watching very, very carefully today. Excellent. Uh, Philip says, I made a Christmas cake four weeks ago and I've started my Christmas shopping already. Don't you have to make cake and put in ages ago before Christmas? Yeah, ages yeah before you Christmas. do. Yeah, I think, what is it? They say a minimum, was it six, seven weeks? You're really down to the last. Yeah. The last of it, if you it's six, seven weeks before the big day. Margaret says, I hate it. I'm a volunteer <laughs> with a well known charity and it is very stressful. People don't realise what people go through trying to keep up with the Joneses. I think November is time enough. Absolutely. Uh, everything agree, starts yeah. too early these days. I agree. I think people put themselves under a lot of stress. Oh, they do. You know, uh, yeah. we, we just do a simple Chris Kindle, everyone gets one present each. And to be honest, I'm there to enjoy the food and the vibes. <laughs> I don't care about the presents. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, in other news, uh, yesterday was, you know, we saw the kickoff of the Late Late Show yeah. and the, the new host, Patrick Kilty. Like, yeah. Martin, so, what are your thoughts? I loved it. Yeah? I, I, I thought the opening was brilliant. I thought it was funny. I laughed out loud a couple of times. I loved the new name, well, the, the, gay, the name he gave to the band. Yeah. yeah. Which I thought was great, Grant Thornton and the Flip Flops. I thought, brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant, Patrick Kilty. You know what I thought was a lovely touch, having Gabo introduce him at the start. That was really poignant, wasn't Beautiful. it? Beautiful. Because apparently Gabo recommended him for yeah. the job when he was stepping out. Yeah. yeah. And that was 1999. He's very warm and likeable, actually. And I've seen his stand-up, but I didn't realise it was a... Brilliant comedian. Yeah. And the timing was really good. And then it got very emotional. And just to, to you know, for those who were, who were saying, well, why are we bringing him in? Well, his family are from Wexford. And told the story, and I, I know people are talking about it today, about the journey they made from Wexford to County Down and mm. to the, the village of Dundrum, where he grew up. But there was a stop at the industrial school in Artane mm. for a few years, and we all know, we've all heard the stories that come out uh, of there yeah. uh, as they were revealed to us. And that would have been quite a tough few years mm. uh, for, for his dad and for uh, his uncle as they made that journey northwards. And then a lovely touch to include the Kilty brothers in London. I thought, I thought he was great. A brilliant opening, a very emotional opening, and uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. I thought there'd be some big heavy hitter so from they. Hollywood or something. So I thought they. it was yeah, quite international a international superstar. It was quite a local collection of 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 guests because even yeah. looking at the six o'clock show uh, on Virgin yesterday, it kind of had more stars really yeah. than the late late last night. I was kind of surprised, <laughs> but I thought maybe that's what they're aiming for—a kind of more intimate and homely feel. Yeah, 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 especially for the first um, episode. Wasn't Mary McAleese a guest on it? I mean, I have it recorded. I'm going to watch it today. But she was on it. I mean, she's a pretty and, big and she, deal. And, she, and the two Johnnies. And, and the, Tommy yeah. Tiernan and then Larita and Hector as well from the podcast. Yeah, I, So yeah. it is yeah, quite local. But still, I know the two Johnnies have a lot of like popularity in a certain age bracket, which could be bringing fresh eyes to the show as well at the same time. Oh, no. I, I yeah. just love the fact that Mary McAleese was referenced a meeting that she had, like a social meeting she had with Patrick where he said he'd love to present the late, late. And then she jokingly said, leave that with me. And then... <laughs> he thought she did something. And then he said, well, did you? And she said... And she, and then she said, are you looking for the two of us to be in front of an Oractus committee? <laughs> <laughs> so, though, when Mary McAleese, former president, is even, you know, having a little bit of joke about it too, it, look, I, I, th I thought it was a good start and well done, Patrick. Yeah, great way to break the ice. Absolutely. Uh, what did you think? Let us know. Uh, but up next, why are Vogue magazine airbrushing some of the most beautiful women in the world? We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. back in the 1990s cat catwalk queens such as Cindy Crawford, Linda Evangelista, Naomi Campbell and Christy Turlington were some of the most famous people on the planet with their extraordinary story about to be told in a new Apple TV series, The Supermodels. But when Vogue magazine recently went to recreate a famous cover of the four fashion icons from that time, it sparked a lot of controversy. And here to tell us why is family therapist and columnist for the Irish Examiner, Richard Hogan, because this sparked you as well. It did, mm -hmm. absolutely. As the father of three daughters, I must say I was pretty, pretty enraged by it. Mm -hmm. OK, so just tell us what Vogue did. Vogue airbrushed the, the images. And so what you have, what we were presented with to the public and to teenage girls and women was this cartoonish image of these very famous paragons of beauty. Yeah. Very famous and very beautiful. beautiful Are they already beautiful? And I found w when I saw this cover, I was 
almost a bit disappointed in Vogue because they have come a long way, especially when it comes to like curve models. Like I was talking to you about this yeah. off, off air. They have models like Paloma S. Elsar that have been on the cover, size 16. And now it's like they've taken a huge step back. So what does this say about how we view women women aging. I think, Katie, you're absolutely right. This is a great moment. This is a great opportunity to show, hey, we all age. Well, and the reality is we don't all age. You know, some of us don't actually make it tr to middle age and beyond. Yeah. So this is, a, you know, something that we should celebrate. And it was, a, I think, a, a, a catastrophic mistake by them and a step backwards and a real message to children and to all of us that aging isn't desirable. And of course, aging is absolutely something that we should celebrate. Imagine if we celebrated who we are in this moment instead of lying about our age and using filters and and using things to kind of change our faces. Wouldn't it be much more, you know, a much healthier life, a much more enjoyable life, a less miserable life? Yeah. Okay, but, but, but these, are, these, these are women who, who were in the late 80s mm. and into the 90s, at the very top of the modeling game. Yeah. And it, it's the, they became the story rather than the brand mm. that, yeah. they were, that they were uh, uh, selling, yeah, selling yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. When, they, when they were on catwalks or on, or, or on TV. And they have, they have aged gracefully. Mm. I think so as well. But they look like cartoons. Yeah. And when I saw the picture myself, I said, wow, is this a drawing or is <laughs> this a photograph? Yeah. Yeah. Did you feel cheated? Well, I thought as the father of three daughters, what a missed opportunity to give a really positive message oh, yeah. around aging. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. what a missed opportunity to tell our children, to tell our daughters and our sons and women and men that aging is actually a good thing mm. and we should celebrate it. I and mean, when you see people like Paul McCartney at 81 out there <laughs> redefining old age and Mick Jagger doing his thing, it redefines old age. Yeah. I mean, that's a celebration of age. You know, we should be like Lear and time and beating on the wall and saying, yeah, it's okay to age yeah. and let's like rage into old age and celebrate what we look like. Let's not hide that. Absolutely. Richard, from your experience in the clinic and also as a father of three yeah. girls, what is the damage you see that is being done by the use of Snapchat filters and Photoshop? Oh, yeah, Cathy, I work with this every day. I work with fantastic teenage girls in particular, but boys too have come into this, into this demographic of people who are kind of affected by image. Oh, this absolute obsession with every facet, the minutia of the face and the body. You know, when I was a kid growing up in the 90s, I never, I actually never heard of abs. I didn't know what abs were. I mean, they weren't something that any of, of the yeah. lads talked about down yeah. playing hurling. You just got fit and you ran and you did those kind of things. Yeah. We didn't know about micros or macros or you certainly weren't looking at your image. And you weren't thinking about my nose and my eyes and my cheekbones and my forehead and my eyelashes. But what I see with teenage girls now is that they are consumed with every f the minutia of their of their facial image. Mm -hmm. And so they're thinking about this part of my eye doesn't look great. I'd like to get this eyebrow done. I'd like to get my nose. There's a little lump here I'd like to get taken off. Yeah. This nostril actually isn't as good as this. And so they're consumed with just the, the smallest little things. And it's just miserable. Yeah. You know, it's just like a lack of celebration of the uniqueness of what you look like. And what I say to them always, I quote John Keats, the great poet, truth is beauty and beauty truth. And that's all we need to know. Mm -hmm. And the more we celebrate the beauty and the truth of us, the more happy we will be in our lives. I think with the, it's, uh, there's a lot of accessibility when it comes to Botox and filler these days, and you, you see girls Well, it's get, so cheap, you see. And it's very cheap, you see, oh, see a lot of young look, girls look, getting them so well, early. And dangerously, not regulated. Exactly. No, yeah. but exactly. see, that, and that was the thing that was always confined to Hollywood, you know, yeah. face, face lifts and all that kind yeah. of stuff. But now it's, for, it's, it's available for everybody. Yeah. And that's, that is, to me, is the dystopian thing here, that girls are getting the mes message. First of all, they shouldn't age, and they shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't look any way normal they shouldn't look you know as they look yeah. and so they're changing their image into this kind of definition of what beauty is I, I remember doing an interview a number of years ago on a previous show I was doing here where somebody was on saying if you're going to get Botox if you're going to get fillers yeah. you need to start in your 20s yeah. and I thought as a prevent I've heard that too but why I don't know why would you, you, know, yeah. you at, at that age yeah. what, what, look, I don't see why you would anyway yeah. but why would you and that, that See, it's presented as so desirable and, and that old, this is exactly what we're talking about, Vogue, mm. that ageing is such a negative thing. The connotations around ageing is so prevented. It's like, you know, that's what it is. It's a preventative measure. It's, but, but, you know, it's like keeping the tide out with a spoon. <laughs> Age hopefully is coming, yeah. you know, and that's, yeah. you, not all of us get to do it and we should celebrate who we are. But that's it exact, that's what Vogue fed into. Richard, you mentioned how it even impacts us being reluctant to appear in photos. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Oh, I, I meet that all the time and I, and I analyse myself 
myself sometimes, and I wonder sometimes, you know, am I happy to be in a photograph? Probably not. You know, and it's a terrible shame, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I'd see my own, you know, daughters and wife the same, and my mother and my mother-in-law, and I'd see my friends and look, thinking about their image and, you know, in their photograph, and where the hell is that coming from? Yeah, yeah. It's the culture above us that's feeding down. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you don't look good in that picture. Look how tired you look in that picture. Look at the wrinkles. And yeah. I remember yeah. I had a friend, and every time we took group photos, she would say, I, I look horrible. That, yeah, get that, rid of it. That. And you, we just ended up having no memories of our time <laughs> together because it is. it probably stemmed from that like body image dysmorphia that you know a lot of girls struggle with because we do look up to media our whole lives on what the, the epitome of beauty really is. Is. Absolutely. But should we, you know, like, how, like, if you could give us some examples, how should we start celebrating ageing? Well, first of all, as I said to you, not all of us get to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there's the first point, that ageing is actually, if you're ageing, that's a great thing. And we should teach your children values very early that they are more than their appearance because that is such, if we take, like, say, if we take, which we do in our Western culture, that youth is the, is the paragon of all things, it's probably between about 15 and 35, let's be honest, right? And so that's only a window of 20 years. The majority of your life then is going to be in misery because you're going to be thinking back on your youth. And let's be honest, when you're youthful, you don't actually celebrate it that well anyway because yeah. you don't realize it, right? <laughs> yeah. And so if we teach your children, and it's something that I came to myself early on in my life, that actually, if you've got that superficial desire about looks and appearance and all that, it's fleeting. Yeah. You should have more value in yourself, and if you if you develop yourself and your value in yourself and how you look, I'm not saying we shouldn't celebrate how we look. We should celebrate how we look. We should celebrate the uniqueness of how we look and who we are on the inside. And I think nothing captures what we're talking about than the selfie. Everything is looking at this superficial. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. not looking inwards, but yeah. it's a superficial self. It's not. It's yeah. There's no depth to the selfie. Yeah. You know, it's not like you know, there's lovely panoramic views going on. <laughs> it's just you, you know, <laughs> in Florence, but you don't see Florence. It's just yeah. you. Just see you. Yeah, yeah. just see and you. A bit of a bridge or and a chapel. Some, or a little thing. Yeah. But it's all so superficial, and we have to help our children out, celebrate who you are, because that is the beauty. That's the true beauty. Okay. Uh, you mentioned how we are in Western culture. You, you've got an experience from yeah. the time when you were in yeah. Eastern culture. Yeah, no, yeah. And, and uh, it's a fascinating it, story. It blew my mind, Martin. I, I have a charity the Philippines I go there every year for the last 17 years right working with the Bajo tribe the most incredible people but I was over in the Philippines and I went into a supermarket many years ago I was about 31 I'd say 30 or 21 I went to buy soap and I just saw whitening and I was like what and I went looking whitening whitening why I couldn't get soap that hadn't whitening in it and I asked the shopkeeper I said why is it why has all the soap got whitening he said well the girls here want to be white and I was thinking, no, that was the first arrow I ever realised. The girls in Ireland who have white skin want to be brown, and the girls in the Philippines who have brown skin want to be white. Yeah. And so we're telling, that's the cultural kind of, uh, that's the cultural ideas around what is desirable. And if you keep people unhappy about who they are, they're going to buy products that have collagen, yep. Yep. and they're going to buy products that whiten your skin or tan your skin. And if the, the more miserable you are, the more susceptible you are to these marketing strategists that want your money. And so what I'm saying, let's celebrate ourselves. Yes. Okay, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you're going to be staying with us, Richard? Yes. Sure. Okay, uh, because uh, <laughs> Richard is staying on uh, to answer any questions that you may have about your children, about their body image, your body image. We'd love to hear from you. We're going to be back again after this break. You're very welcome back. Now, before the break, we were talking about how Vogue magazine airbrushing the 90s supermodels has played into the increasing pressure that our young people feel around having the perfect body image. Family therapist Richard Hogan has stayed with us to delve into it further and answer some of your questions. Thank you for staying with us once again. And I know we were talking about this uh, a while ago when we were out in the corridor, but um, and it's a question that many mothers are... are really worried about and, and this particular mother says my daughter is obsessed with filters i'm worried about you uh, worried about her have you any advice for yeah. her now the problem is and i was saying it a, a little while ago i downloaded snapchat to chat to my young teenage nieces and nephews it's the only reason i have it and i got a fright basically when i saw the filters etc that are available mm. it's no wonder they're obsessed with filters and not accepting the way they are so what advice would you give to yeah. parents dealing with this i think you're absolutely right and I, I think never in our history as a species have we got more potential for our daughters and our young girls to be miserable in their lives because of, because of filters because of this unrealistic uh, this unrealistic um, <coughs> image 
image that they're presenting to themselves and then when they look in the mirror it's a very stark reality when they see that themselves in reality isn't what the what the uh, filter is showing them yeah. I think that's a really miserable thing so we, again it's early preve preventative stuff here with your children is really crucial it's hard when they're 17 because the kind of it's kind of gone you know it's kind yeah. of they've gone in there so if your daughter's about 16 or 17 it's about helping her to understand and celebrate who she is and look at you know the reality of her face and I, I, a bit of what I would say to teenagers at that age is that if everyone looks the same way because that's what they're kind of doing mm -hmm. no one's unique then yeah. that's it yeah. and I think it's a lot of inner work that we have to do because especially girls that age that teenage age will base you know their value especially when they start dating on how they look compared to this girl yeah. with, with this kind of skin and that body type and you will just lose yourself and I speak from experience I mean we all do yeah. you know I, but I feel like that didn't really start to change for me until I did a lot of like self Do you yeah know what I mean? exactly and yeah. that's what i'm saying before you hand a, a device to your child when they're young with the device i think it's really important that you help them to process what they're going to see because mm. they're going to see so much stuff there that's going to be you know negative and yeah. deleterious for their mental health and so you have to help them about the reality of like what you look like and then a filter and that's not truth and that's not reality and what most of what you see on, online is filtered that's not reality yeah and when you think about Listen, I've been working in the TV industry since I was 22. Yeah. That's, a, that's a long time yeah, ago now. Absolutely. But even looking at myself on TV and progressing over the years has been hard enough. So I don't even know how young people deal with it. I mm. downloaded Snapchat, as I said, to talk to the kids. And I, I can't believe I'm going to show you this before. <laughs> I was well, looking. That's good, I was yeah. a bit tired a few weekends ago <laughs> and I woke up to that. But that's the before and after. Literally two seconds apart right. and that's... That's, I'm sorry, I was looking at myself. It, I would love to look like that in real life. It's like a sheet of makeup without looking like makeup the filter has, so that's why I mean, people are so tempted normal to Normal my it. face to... And, if, and I know that. I'm an adult. I've studied this stuff for years. I've dealt, I've written about it for years. I, I'm very body positive. But if that is making me feel insecure about myself mm. by doing a simple Snapchat f feature, the psychological impact that can have on anybody, it, 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 young or old, is absolutely catastrophic. And if parents are doing that to yeah. themselves, of course the kids are going to pick up on it. Yeah. I, I have to say, watching that there, Lane, gave me goosebumps. Right, I actually have to say I got a little bit kind of goose because that's exactly what people need to see. Yeah. And I commend you for that courage because it is hard for us to put ourselves up as we are. And that takes incredible courage. And, you it's know, not that, that courageous. I mean, it sometimes does, I look no, like the wreck of the heads person. No, it's fine it's to do that. But it you know does, it? you see. And that's what, that's what Vogue did, you know. Yeah. It fed this culture of like having to be perfect all the time. And that, that woman who asked about my daughter and filters, that's what she needs to see. Yeah, because she needs to that, see. that filter will make your lips look a bit more plump uh, and like probably fill up your eyes. I don't know if... if people have eye yeah. bags everyone has eye bags yeah. well on the topic of lip fillers it's something that I'm seeing a lot of teenage yeah. girls want to get and we have a question here my daughter thinks she needs lip fillers and wants them when she turns 18 what do I tell her well I'd ask her questions first of all around why she thinks she needs lip fillers yeah. what is you know what's enough there and I would say fundamentally underneath that there's a part of that she's not enough and I'd really need to get in there and help her to kind of have those conversations yeah. there's an insecurity there yeah. and also uh, we have a question because it's not just the girls that are affected by this through the boys as well my yeah. son thinks that six packs and massive muscles are the norm even as a teenager he puts himself under serious pressure. There's an actual thing called oh, yeah. orthorexia now that I know a lot of young yeah. boys are suffering from. Yeah. It's a clinical eating disorder when they're obsessed with health, building muscle, being healthy and that's what we're seeing an awful lot of now. I would have seen an, an increase in the last number of years with uh, steroid use. Yeah. Right. It's, it's an inc and we've had a couple of stories where unfortunately tragically things didn't work out for the person who took steroids in, in, our, in our cohort of young men. Right. Because of things like Love Island that normalise that everybody walks around with a six pack and, uh, and the reality is often the behaviours to get to that whatever it is, 6% body fat or whatever, which is not health, you yeah. know, to get there is actually a very unhealthy behaviour, you know, and, and I'd hear people going on you know, narratives that they take stairs before their holidays, their 1830 holiday, their six year summer to, to kind of take out the water out of their body so that they're, they're their muscles are more defined for a, a summer holiday. And that then is, they're getting dehydrated and, 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 that's drinking the, and drinking alcohol. That is dystopian stuff. And again, we have to celebrate who we are and you know, celebrate what we look like and who we are. That's the most Absolutely. important thing to teach your children. Richard Hoven, thank you so much for your insight. I know Not people at, at home thank will you. appreciate that. Now, after the break, we'll be stuffing our faces with oysters in the kitchen. We know this show is about the viewers, but we have a bit of shellfish every now and <laughs> Selfish. <laughs> Yeah.
You're very welcome back to Ireland AM this Saturday morning. Here is a pearl of wisdom. If you ever feel crabby or like you might clam up, have yourself an oyster and all those bad vibes will just wash away. All these fishy jokes today, I, I, I can't handle it. Gary, Gary Hughes from the Shelburne Hotel is here and he's going to help us out with a lesson in oyster shucking. Welcome to Ireland AM, Gary. Thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so in the Shelburne for the month of September, we're all about oysters. So there's oysters everywhere in the hotel. So today I'm just going to show you two oyster dishes that we have on. Yeah. And they're very easy, you can do them at home. Yeah. And if you're a bit nervous about eating an oyster, the first one I'm doing is a flaggy shore oyster. It's called the Dainty. It's the smallest oyster you can eat. And it's, it's really easy. So uh, what you would look for in an oyster is there's no bad smell. Mm -hmm. It's not open. Either of those, throw it out. Yeah. Okay, and then when you're storing your oyster, you store it like that. If you store it like this, all the liquid comes out and the I oyster dies. Okay, okay. okay. So when you're opening the oyster, oyster knife with a guard. Okay, you can get them without a guard. That's dangerous because if you slip with the knife, it's either going to go into your wrist or into the palm of your hand. This sounds awfully dangerous. Yes. It's awfully dangerous so eating. There's kind of a flat side on the oyster and you kind of have to wedge it open. So what you would do is always use a cloth to hold it in place. Okay. And then down with the knife, you can hear it. Yeah. And then you would slide it across to break the muscle. And now, is oyster shucking something that can be done safely at home? You're, I wouldn't really. recommend it. <laughs> yeah. And always rinse your oyster out because you might See, get that's why bits I got, of grit. I got stuck with this last year. We did oyster tasting and I literally ate it straight from the shell and there yeah. was loads of sand and grit and disgusting stuff and I was traumatised, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, so no, we're all, not doing all, this always rinse it because you don't know yeah. what's going to be in there. Um, you might get bits of grit, you might get little wiggly worms, you might get anything. Oh, don't say that. So for the, worms. So, so we've rinsed them, we're rinsing these. Ones I, anyway I've, the I've rinsed this one. So yeah. I'm going to move on to the tempura oyster. So I'm using a Carlingford oyster, it's slightly bigger. So all you would do is dust your oyster in some seasoned flour. So you do the same, you shuck it yeah. and you rinse it. And you then dry you it. Seasoned flour there. Seasoned so flour into tempura oyster. So if you can get the blue dragon oyster, yeah. like all the ingredients for this today you can get in the Asian market and you drop it into your fryer at 170 degrees. 170, you have to be precise about that. Now, but when you're cooking shellfish though, um, does it not get very tough very quickly? Do you, how careful do you have to be? It can do. Like it's, the longer you cook it, pieces of fish are going to cook like in two or three minutes. The longer you cook it, it's just going to dry out. Okay, yeah. so it's similar to sort of if you're making calamari and the likes yeah. of that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Just drop it into your fryer. Always when you put it into your fryer, put it away from you. Yeah. Because there could be an air pocket in there and it could blow up. Okay, right. okay. Quite so, dangerous. Gary, you mentioned um, September is the month for oysters at the Shelburne Hotel. Would yes. this be the best season for oysters throughout this, the year? They say any month that doesn't have the letter R, you shouldn't eat oysters. Okay. So generally the summer months, but they're produced all year round. Yeah. Uh, there's some fabulous producers, like during the lockdown and we were in La Scanner, I came across the dainty oysters and I was just blown away by them. Also, like everybody would always say, oh, um, Carlingford oysters or Galway oysters, but if, if, if you're not big into your oysters and you want a, a, a subtle one, there's lovely oysters from Dungarvan. In Waterford, right? Yeah, then. some really nice oysters. So they're just cooking in there. So with the tempura oysters, I've just done a truffle mayonnaise. So just got some mayonnaise, I've got some truffle paste, you can get it in Marks and Spencer, some truffle oil, Ooh, blitz it, it up, lovely. and that's it. So they're cooking there. Now, so for the dressing for the flaggy oysters, the ones that we just yeah. opened first, it's very, very easy. So all I have is some yuzu. So that's a Japanese citrus fruit. If you can't get that, you can do a mixture of lemon and lime. Yeah. Okay. So yuzu, I have some soy sauce. And then I have some mirin, which is that's rice mirin. wine. Okay, lovely. So this kind of pickle it in some slightly. Yeah. I have some vinegar. Now the backs that I'm making here would do you for, for ages. And then some ginger. Oh, There's I some chopped ginger. ginger. And that's it. That's your That's dressing. It. That's your dressing. That's, That's okay. your dressing. So you can make that the day before. Uh, if your guests are coming to your to your house, you can open the oysters before. They can sit in the fridge for a couple of hours. They'll be fine. That's your dressing. And can they sit in the fridge uncovered then, or do you, would you wrap them with? Some I, I I wouldn't. I would film. sit them maybe on a bed of ice with a damp cloth. Yeah. Okay. And that that would be it. After you've opened them. After you've opened okay. them. Okay. And you haven't taken your hand off. Okay. Got the same. So I'm, I'm a bit worried now. <laughs> Well, there is a lot of caution that goes into it and for it to taste so good. But um, is there any pointers if you know an oyster has gone bad? I know you mentioned the smell. Yeah, so the, smell is, the smell is the first thing. And if it's open, if it's slightly open. Yeah. And then when you do open it, if it's flat, it's kind of like an egg as it gets older. It kind of loses its shape. Yeah. So if in doubt, 
throw it out. No, throw I, it out. I yeah. know they frequently serve Guinness with oysters, but you were saying champagne is nice with oysters as well. That's more Shelburne esque, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> if, uh, as soon as I say oysters to my wife, she goes champagne. Oh that, yeah. That, that, that's it. And I was speaking to your wife. They say it's an aphrodisiac as well. We won't go there. That's too much for this hour no, morning. But um, that's the champagne. Yeah. There, there, you, go. Champagne. there you go. So look, our, our oysters are actually cooked here already. Already. Wow. Yeah. So you just let them drain off. Yeah. And then what we will do is we just season them up with some salt. Okay. Bit of sea salt there. That's it. I can't lie, the tempura oysters are tempting it, I, me. I'm not going to lie. I was kind of scared and oh. traumatised after, after the last year's oyster experience because um, I, I, I did get a bit of a fright. But cause so it's now hard. you only have them fried? It's, uh, oh, no, I, I got a bit of a fright, not I only have them fried. Oh, no, Sorry. because of that, you no. only have them fried? No, then. I haven't had them since. That's what oh. I'm trying to say. Oh, great. OK, this so, is good. Yeah. So do you, do you use your dressing? You would just put it slightly over your oysters? And then I've just garnished it with some chilli and some spring onion. OK. And then also what I, what I have here in the front as well, which is the classical oysters. So it's the dainties again with a red wine shallot vinegar, which is the classical way with some Tabasco. Yeah. So if you want to kind of start off in your oyster experience, you don't have to go straight to a lot of the purists, what they go, yes, you shuck it in front of you and off it goes down no. the throat. No, the, you, no, this is the way to do it. I'm a chef for years and the first time I had oysters, they were actually smoked oysters. We actually smoke oysters oh, in the lovely. hotel. Okay. And we did it with a truffle cream sauce. And then I went, yeah, that's really nice. And then I got brave. But like, I would eat a dainty before a Carlingford because Carlingford are bigger. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so if you're eating oysters for the first time, go small. Right, I, I, do you know what? I might hop over to you now. Okay. And I'll do the dainty thing. Oh, the dainty thing. Right. Okay. Can we do it at the same time? No. <laughs> you can do the tempura. Or you want to do the dainty as no, well. I'll do the tempura if you're, if you're well, not. No, I was, I was no. going to volunteer. I was going to take one for the team. But if you want to do that as well, right, here Forks we go. Forks there. If you need a fork to push so it out. So what do we do now? Well, you okay. can just go this straight down, but I would, so, I would chew. See, last year they made me go straight down and it got stuck in my throat. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was traumatising, traumatising. So we have it here. There's the, um, what do you call it again, the sauce again? The so that's the uzu. Uzu. So, so, that's so that's can the you ponzu. kind of fork and what's it this? Out? Yes, that's exactly what you do. Just chilli? That's chilli and some spring onion. Okay, are you ready? Mm. Yeah. Cheers. On, just make sure. Three, two, one. Do I run? Okay. Mm-hmm. That's actually lovely. That's lovely Obviously. with the seasoning. <laughs> That's lovely. I think oh. the, the first time I ever had oysters, it That's just really tasted nice. like the sea. But this, with the chilli and the flavour yeah. and the lemongrass, gorgeous. No, but because before, I mean, when you do have too much seawater and you have too much um, grittiness going on, yeah. you can't actually enjoy the flavour. They're very yeah. flavoursome. Come on, we try a tempura. So dip, dip it in the dip it in truffle the mayo. Truffle mayo. Oh, I never dipped nice. it in that. Was that the No, that was already in the okay. shell. Of napkins. Mmm. Mmm. That's lovely. I'm going to Shelburne after this, will we? <laughs> Have some champagne and oysters. Let's go. <laughs> absolutely, just absolutely lovely. So, I mean, uh, where, so if you are, in fairness, if people are watching this now at home and they want to try this, you said shucking at home is going to be dangerous, in fairness. So if you're getting them done in your fishmongers, how long will they last? So you can, you can, if you collect them in the fishmongers and you go straight home, yeah. so you want to keep them below five degrees, yeah. put them into your fridge, and then you can have them that evening. Why don't mm. you just keep them cold? Like when I arrived today, I had all my oysters on ice, mm -hmm. you know, and they're still okay. Right, mm. so if they, they are in the fridge, that's on a tray of ice. Yeah. And then you mentioned a damp cloth? Yeah, damp cloth, like a, like a clean blue cloth. Just on put top it over of the, the ice, yeah. and then... And they'll, they'll keep for that evening. Okay, mm. okay. Mm. Well. Sorry, I'm just... <laughs> Gary, so Gary, much. you've converted the lane here. Converting. I thought that was impossible. <laughs> that yeah. was on my, my list of never eating again. There you go, you learn something new every day. Now, earlier, we cooked up some pork, I don't know how to pronounce this, pozole for Mexican Independence Day. Here's how we did it. Cut your meat and boil until so tender it starts to crumble. While it cooks, drain your dried chilies and place them into a food processor with your garlic, oregano and stock. Allow the resulting sauce to cook into a soup, adding the remainder of your stock. Serve with a range of garnishes including lettuce, white cabbage, onion and radishes while also making sure there's plenty of meat in each bowl. All right, coming up on Sunday, uh, radio and TV royalty, uh, Marie Ronan and Jenny Kelly talk friendship and podcasting. 
We'll find out how we can protect Ireland's precious sea creatures. Plus, we're smashing burgers in the kitchen and layering for autumn on the catwalk. We'll be back here from nine. Now, Martin, what? if I was brave enough to do it, oh, you oh, have to do this it. This fella ran a mile away from the other. I'm telling yeah. you, they're delicious. They you ran you during this. the week. They said, we're doing oysters. And they said, I'm not. Yeah. Try uh, that one. That one's okay. nice and compact. Okay. okay. With the truffle nice. mayo. With, no, no. with the truffle no, mayo. Think it's it. lovely. Your batter, it's really, really nice. Do you want me to mind it's like eat this? Mind how I eat it. The flavour is lovely. ASMR. Well. Mm. Good. Mm. Good. See. Okay. Would you eat a second one? Would you oh, we need some of, champagne. Right, the other right. ones? No, I'll tell you what, though, girls. I think I saw you as double dipping. Yeah. Oh. And actually, they were double dipping. <laughs> Took you. Before we go they were double dipping. Now, I do have to say a big, huge happy birthday to my nephew, Eli. He is double digits today. That's my Hi, little Eli. Oh, happy the birthday, best Eli. little boy in the universe. I hope you're spoiled rotten today. Have a lovely party and don't miss me too much because I'm stuck in Dublin and I can't come down. You know, <laughs> work and stuff, which gets in that the way. That just means a bigger present. Yeah. Now, if we just mentioned quickly, we had Richard Hogan on. Karen just said, oh, Richard's amazing. I'm 50 and I worry all the time what I look like. Makes you miserable. He's correct. Well, great. Uh, Peter said it's refreshing to hear some chat about young boys. Boys, they face yes. a lot of pressure that is less often talked about. Yes. Yeah. It's a privilege tonight to many, so we should yeah. embrace every Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. See you uh, tomorrow, guys. Enjoy Bye. the rest of your Saturday. Bye. 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 Bye.